on the Smith alongside Brad Smith. And as you can tell, we are not in our usual studio location today. Oh, we sure are not. That's right, Shauna. Today, Yahoo Finance and the Morning Brief are live from the NASDAQ to ring the opening bell and celebrate a huge milestone here. We are rolling out new premium plans and content offerings. It's really a new community for investors. That's right. So when it's time for the market to open this morning, the Yahoo Finance team will be in the building to ring the opening bell. We certainly are looking forward to that. But first, let's get right to it. The three things that you need to know this morning, your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman, Josh Schaefer, and Madison Mills have more. Stock futures are higher this morning as Wall Street hopes for no further escalation in the Middle East conflict. This comes after Iran launched an unprecedented air attack against military facilities in Israel Saturday night. Iran struck Israel with more than 300 drones and missiles in what Iran is calling a response to a strike on its consulate in Syria earlier this month. World leaders are calling on Israel not to retaliate as tensions reached a boiling point over the weekend. In a fresh reading on the consumer, retail sales continuing their upward trend, rising seven-tenths of a percent in March compared to the month prior. Despite higher interest rates and elevated prices, March's retail sales report shows the consumer remains resilient. And Goldman Sachs beats Wall Street's expectations. This follows a similar trend that we saw on Friday, kicked off by J.P. Morgan City and Wells Fargo. But Goldman having this surge in profit up to 28% here. The bank's net interest income also beating analyst expectations with revenues increasing from a year ago. That is due to the uptick in fees due to investment banking at that bank. And this beat following a difficult year for the CEO, David Solomon, because of a slew of executive changes in their leader and also a general slowdown in deal making. It is a big Monday morning for Yahoo Finance. We are coming to you live from the NASDAQ in the heart of Midtown Manhattan, where we will be ringing the opening bell in less than 30 minutes. But first, let's get to this morning's market action, because we are seeing some green across the screen movement to the upside. Strong retail sales and earnings beat are really driving this morning's reaction. Also, investors growing a bit more confident that the rising tension in the Middle East is going to remain contained. Today's moves follow Friday's sell-off. Now all three of the major averages on track to open to the upside here. That's right. We've got a lot of data to dive into. Plus, as we're tracking futures, pointing to gains despite those tensions that you mentioned in the Middle East reaching a tipping point over the weekend here. There's much more to consider as Iran perpetrating what the White House is calling an unprecedented air attack on Israel over the weekend, launching more than 300 drones and missiles. President Biden urging caution as Israel weighs its response to the attack. To break down what's next for the conflict, Yahoo Finance's very own Rick Newman joins us here at the desk. Rick, what do we know so far and what's the White House response been? Well, first of all, astonishing development that Iran filed, fired th- uh, th- something like 300 drones, missiles, including uh, ballistic missiles, the ones that go up into space and are hard, hard, you know, harder to hit down. And not a single one of them apparently hit its target. Uh, Israel, along with the United States and other allies, apparently shot all of them down. So, number one, that is remarkable. Number two, uh, look what's happening with oil prices today, actually ticking down a little bit. So the markets are relieved. And I think what markets now want to see is, could we, could we just say this is it? No more, no more overt shooting at each other. So Israel has a choice to make. Is Israel going to retaliate back uh, against Iran? And then if they do, is it going to be a country on country strike that the whole world sees? Or is it going to be something covert? I think markets are saying, hey, Israel, whatever you do, make it covert. Please don't rattle markets any more than they are right now. Rick, what does that leave the U.S.? Because there's also talk maybe about increased sanctions on Iran. What exactly that could then, just in terms of the implications for the energy market specifically, also the broader market. So what could that potentially look so, like? So one other minor little complication here, President Biden running for re-election. And guess what President Biden needs? He needs gasoline prices to not go any higher. And certainly he doesn't want them cresting that, you know, that $4 mark, which is where people freak out. So Biden has been doing everything he can to keep oil and gasoline prices down. So I don't think you're going to see anything U.S. led um, that is going to affect global oil supplies. Could there be other sanctions on Iran? I guess Um, there have been sanctions on Iran that haven't been real effective. Um, So I, I, you know, I I think, by the way, for what it's worth, Iran, this is embarrassing for Iran. I mean, um, they they tried this the first time they've ever attacked Israel from their own turf. 
uh, in, such a, in such an overt way that the whole world is watching. And the United States telegraphed it. Everybody knew it was coming. U.S. intelligence, very good. The world was prepared. In right. fact, I mean, I think you could say that uh, the U.S. warning that this was coming late last week actually conditioned markets a little bit. So sure. that might have been why we, sold the, we saw the sell-off on Friday. And uh, markets price this in, sure. ama am amazingly. Uh, so markets price this in, at least in terms of oil. Uh, so I think what we're going to see from the U.S. and any kind of sanctions now is, could we please just stabilize the situation? It's a possible opening for Israel. Mm -hmm. It's got world opinion back on its side. Um, can Israel and its leader, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, can they use that to their advantage? And, you know, their possible best case outcome here is Israel says, we've got an opportunity here. Maybe it's time to start winding down. Uh, the operations in Gaza and um, try to retain a little bit of this global goodwill that we have. All right, Rick, thanks so much for joining sure us thing. here at the desk and breaking down the latest on that. We want to stick with that since it is our top story here this morning and taking a look at the reaction or really lack thereof that we're seeing within the energy market oil prices here. Israel fending off air attacks from Iran over the weekend, crude and Brent both actually falling this morning. Now, prices did rise initially on the attack. Here to break it all down and how these tensions may impact global crude prices, we want to bring in Ellen Wall at Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center, president of Transversal Consulting. It's great to have you here, Ellen. Thanks so much for making the time to join us this morning. So talk to us just about the reaction that we're seeing play out in energy markets. I think initially investors were expecting a spike in the price of oil. So why are we seeing the reaction that we are? today. Well, what we're seeing is really reflective of the fact that this attack had absolutely no impact on any oil supplies. And the truth is that there wasn't really much of a threat of that. I think a lot of the threat that traders or investors were getting uh, concerned about had to do with some reports uh, that um, sources in the White House were telling uh, people on Wall Street that um, you know this could turn into a huge uh, conflagration and with economically devastating effects all around the world. And um, that's definitely something that did not materialize over the weekend. Uh, I think also the fact that the attack happened over the weekend when markets were closed gave uh, a lot of the, the traders time to assess what it really means and the fact that there was never any danger to any oil supplies and uh, that that's uh, continuing to be the case now. And Ellen, just to describe what our viewers may have been seeing on the screen there, the interception of some of those missiles that our own uh, Rick Newman was talking about a moment ago. Okay, and so if this particular event is muted or already priced in or contained to a certain extent, where does much of the attention within the oil market and the energy market shift to, especially as we move into the summer months here? Yeah, so I think that um, there's definitely still some concern over um, is Israel going to uh, then retaliate uh, in, in some other way? Uh, I think the likelihood that that kind of retaliation or attack would in any way damage Iran's oil supplies is is pretty low. Uh, at this point, they seem really focused on eliminating the terrorist commanders that are impacting, uh, you know, Israel's territory. Uh, and then uh, beyond that, we get into the summer months. We're looking at pretty high uh, rates of oil demand. Uh, but really, I think the next big thing to keep an eye on is uh, OPEC is going to be meeting June 2nd. And with OPEC keeping its output uh, curbs in place, that's really, uh, I think, uh, keeping oil prices elevated. And the pressure is really going to be on OPEC to uh, increase output and bring those oil prices down, especially, uh, as you mentioned, uh, with Biden facing re-election. Ellen, when it comes to uh, potentially the U.S.'s response here down the road beyond an Israeli strike, there has been some talk amongst officials that we could see increased sanctions on Iran. What would tighten sanctions? What would the implications then of that be for the energy market? Uh, at this point, it's really unclear what more what sanctions they can uh, put on Iran more than they have now. The issue is really in implementation. Uh, are they going to uh, crack down and enforce these sanctions more str stridently? So uh, right now, they they kind of enforce them uh, in in some ways, but the truth is that China and and other uh, countries are buying a lot of contraband Iranian oil. Uh, the Iranian government is making a large amount of money from this, uh, but at 
at the same time, there's a benefit to that because it keeps Iranian oil on the market, albeit at somewhat discounted prices for Iran. But uh, it also um, means that Iran has something to lose. If all of Iran's oil exports were cut off, Iran would have less to lose and it would be more motivated to do something very drastic, like potentially try to shut down uh, passage to the Straits of Hormuz. So there is a benefit in letting Iran export some oil. So I think it's a very fine line that, that the administration's got to walk here between how much you want to enforce these sanctions and how much you want to let Iran make money from uh, its oil. And, uh, I, you know, it's, it's a good question. I think we'll probably see some kind of symbolic action, some sanctions that, that aren't really going to make much of a difference slapped on so they can say that they've done something. Thing. Yeah. And so, Ellen, just further down that, I mean, in the hypothetical that there was a blockage of the Strait of Hormuz, then the U.S. would be prompted to respond in that instance, right? Yeah, I, I, the U.S. Navy is essentially, you know, in the Persian Gulf to ensure that uh, everyone's got safe passage there. It's it's quite a tricky area, uh, the Straits of Hormuz. And, and if Iran were to try to uh, block, uh, you know, Saudi, Kuwaiti, Iraqi uh, ships or any other ships from uh, import from from getting in to get oil from these countries or out, uh, the U.S. Navy would respond clearly by not letting Iranian ships leave the Persian Gulf too. So it's it's only it's mm. only a win situation for Iran if they have nothing to lose. Otherwise, uh, they're going to suffer even more because their entire source of income would be cut off. They have no real other way to export uh, oil other than, than out of the Persian Gulf. Ellen, thanks so much for taking the time here this morning, really laying everything straight as we continue to track any continuing developments here in that region. Ellen Wald, who is the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center and president of Transversal Consulting. Thanks so much for taking the time here today. Well, retail sales coming in above expectations, rising seven-tenths of a percent. That is well above expectations of a gain of four-tenths of a percent. So hotter than expected, Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer has the breakdown here. Josh, what do we know about uh, another hot reading on retail front here? Yeah, Brad, I want to take a look at some of the numbers here. So you just mentioned that headline number for us, increasing 0.7% compared to the 0.4% that Wall Street had expected. Also notable there, X Auto and Gas increasing 1.1%, again, significantly above the street's expectation. Also, when you look back to that February report, you saw a pretty big revision. So retail sales were revised up to have shown that they increased 0.9% in the month of February. So right there, you're looking at pretty two strong months of gains after we had January down. And then when you take a look at where people were buying items, right, where did retail sales increase the most? Non-store retailers, what is your e-commerce section, increase the most? And sort of something interesting to point out here that economists flagged right after the release, when you're looking at what's on your screen now, perhaps maybe a little bit of a lack of breath in retail sales in the month of March. So that'll be something to watch moving forward as you'd want to see sales picking up in a large amount of categories. And that was not really the case in this report. But we should note, stock futures were up a little bit after this news. And largely, I think, guys, that's because when you take a look at the report, what we were looking from it, we're really just wondering if higher borrowing costs are starting to weigh on the consumer to any extent, right? And if the Fed can keep at these high rates. And right now, this report shows that, yes, the economy is healthy enough for the, Ked, for the Fed to keep interest rates up higher. And so that's sort of the broad takeaway, I think, from this report this morning. All right, Josh, thanks so much. Teeing up this next conversation for us as well here. Another sign the consumer remains resilient despite rising inflation, retail sales jumping seven-tenths of a percent in March compared to the prior month. That was above expectations. And February's reading, that was also revised higher. So with this data, along with the backdrop of a strong labor market, what does this mean for the Fed's path towards cutting rates? Let's bring in Michael Darda, Roth MKM chief economist and macro strategist. Great to have you here with us this morning, Michael. I want to get first your response to what this means for the Fed. Thanks for having me on. Look, I think this is another body blow to expectations for near-term Fed rate cuts, which have already really been backed out pretty materially. But if you remember, we came into the year and markets were expecting six to seven Fed rate cuts. Now it's less than two. And so we have several months of pretty hot inflation readings. And in, you know, now this March report on retail sales, we had some upward revisions and the numbers came in uh, much better than expected. So I think in this environment, the, the Fed is simply going to be, you know, 
pushing back in terms of when they would likely start uh, to entertain any kind of a notion of easing monetary policy. The data at this point, based on the criteria they laid out previously, just does not uh, support it. Michael, what's your base case just in terms of then how many cuts you are expecting? Is it two still a sure thing, or do you think maybe it's more likely we could get one or potentially none at all? Yeah, my view has been that, you know, I do think the Fed eventually will get around to lowering policy rates and easing this year, but it's going to be back half of the year loaded. I think they're going to be very reluctant to start that process until it's really much more obvious that the economy is losing steam and that some of these stickier measures of inflation, which have been hot recently, are starting to ease, and that's going to take some time. And so what I'm worried about is if the Fed really waits until it's obvious that the economy is weakening and we don't have you know, that at this moment in time, they're likely to be behind the curve. And so that's really the balancing act for the Fed here. The two tail risks are if they wait too long and the economy turns down, then you're going to have um, issues with earnings. If they ease too soon or by too much, you know, then then you have a reacceleration, high inflation risk that could hurt valuations. And risk markets really aren't considering either scenario. You know, we're basically priced to perfection here. And what do we have? You know, long-term interest rates are moving back up towards the cycle highs, and so that's a that's a problem for uh, for these lofty valuations, in my view. Michael, I wonder what you believe the earnings commentary is going to sound like this season with the Fed that may be to what you're saying behind the curve in some of the cutting. If we do see uh, signs of a recession start to show up rapidly and them not be in a position to have already implemented some of those cuts. Sure. And uh, let me just flesh that out a little bit. I mean, you know, if you brought someone on that was really optimistic, they'd say, well, what are you talking about? You've got incredible payroll growth, a low unemployment rate, the retail sales figures are strong, inflation's been high. But look at some of the survey data, right? We have small businesses where their hiring intentions have really fallen off a cliff That's the leading indicator for the unemployment rate. The ISM services index for March showed weakness in employment three out of the last four months, sub 50. You know, that's more consistent with payroll growth that's flat to even negative. So this weakness in the survey data <clears throat> against the backdrop of a long yield curve inversion, weakness in the monetary aggregates that's been ongoing for an extended period of time, you know, that is a environment I think you're late in the cycle and, and we could see surprising weakness later on in, in the year. We're certainly we're certainly not there yet. So the, the earnings commentary better be good, right? Because you have equity market valuations that have ramped up above a 20 forward multiple, and that's already with earnings expectations at double digit growth rates. So we really have priced in an environment of spectacular growth, falling inflation, you know, the Fed being very benign, and if it all comes together, then great. But, you know, that's what's priced in. So if we start to see surprises, then I think that's where you could get more equity market turbulence. Michael, how big of a pullback do you think we could potentially see here if earnings don't live up to expectations? If we do see a bit of an escalation of tensions uh, over in the Middle East, the risk that poses to the market. And then when you talk about this risk here to the downside, how much more likely is it that we're going to see this increased volatility then for maybe longer than we initially anticipated? Well, if, I think if one studies market history, uh, you, they wouldn't be surprised to, to hear me say 15 or 20 percent in terms of a pullback in the S&P 500. Easy. And that's not even with the recession scenario unfolding. If a recession unfolds, it could be more than that. Uh, we were seeing that in the last cycle. Uh, going into 2018, where equity multiples were rising, but they weren't quite as high as they are today, uh, and bond yields were actually much lower, and we had a 10% correction and almost a 20% later uh, that year with no recession. So with valuations at these levels, uh, I think the risk is going to be for you know unexpected uh, unexpected retrenchment in, in risk assets. So 15 or 20% would not surprise me at all, given this incredible run that markets have, have had with very, very suppressed volatility. Market history would tell us that you know, we should be uh, worried about surprises in an environment like that. How, how should people be positioning their portfolios? Let's give uh, folks some actionable strategy here to close out the conversation, Michael. 
Sure. Well, I would just recommend not getting too excited about chasing everything that has worked so well, consumer discretionary, on a tear, tech, on a tear. <clears throat> but the valuations there are incredibly lofty, so the expectations are, are already quite high. Uh, I think some of the defensive areas are worth a look. Uh, uh, utility stocks have really underperformed year to date as, as bond yields have jumped up. Uh, we recommended them last October when the 10-year run ran to 5%, and they had a nice move, and now recently they've been under pressure again. But that's an area, I think, that is protected from the business cycle, and if you're a contrarian, I think it makes some sense to, to, to add that area to the portfolio. We're talking about retail sales, but I would be much more hesitant on the consumer discretionary sector versus state. So I think some of these more defensive areas that are more insulated from the business cycle that have been hurt recently by rising long rates, if you think we're late in the cycle and you know and recession risk is still out there, then those areas I think make a lot of sense. All right, Michael Darda, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us here this morning on Yahoo Finance. Thanks so much. Thank you. Let's get to a big story today, and it's time for today's stock to watch. That is Goldman Sachs shares on the move to the upside. Look at that gain of just about 4% climbing here after posting an earnings beat in the first quarter, reporting a 28% jump in net income from a year ago. Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills standing by here in the newsroom at the Nasdaq for the latest on that move. Maddie. Well, we have this huge surge in profits that you mentioned, Sean, of 28 percent, and it's nearly a one billion dollar beat compared with Wall Street estimates, really beating across the board for all of those estimates here. So why exactly is that? Well, I want to pull out one specific data point here. We have fixed income currency and commodities trading and sales. That number came in at four point three billion. The estimate was only three point six billion. So why this huge success that we're seeing here? Well, they're refocusing on their core Wall Street business and having a more predictable approach to their money management unit this coming after they've faced a lot of criticism, particularly throughout 2023, about defocusing on their retail banking unit in particular. Uh, the bank has also faced a lot of general criticism and challenges. A lot of executives have been leaving over the past year. Obviously, you have a difficult macro backdrop with a decline in overall deal making. So that makes this beat even more of a win for Goldman Sachs and particularly CEO David Solomon as he has had the difficult leading the charge as all of these challenges have amassed for the bank. Now, just to compare to some of the other earnings that we're going to be getting in, equities trading for Goldman coming in better than J.P. Morgan and is expected to be better than Morgan Stanley, which we're going to get later on this week. And again, I want to emphasize that this is a beat across the board, totaling at least a billion dollars. All right, Mass and Mills, thanks so much for breaking that down for us. Again, Goldman here at least ahead of the opening bell, trading to the upside on the heels of the better than expected results. All right, morning brief viewers, it is our time to shine. Brad and I, we're heading downstairs to the opening bell. Don't worry, we are going to take you guys along for the ride with us. That's right. We're going to document our journey through the NASDAQ. Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills has got you covered. She's going to take over for the opening bell here, but we got to get on down to this ceremony. Of course, we're going to bring you every step of our journey down to the opening cross here at the NASDAQ, Shauna. We will. I know. We're really excited for this. This is my first time ringing the NASDAQ opening bell. Brad, though, history tells me it's not actually your first time. I mean, this is old stomping ground. I used to work here and I've rang uh, one opening bell before and that was with my mother actually for 1-800-Flowers for Mother's Day. Hey mom, love you. It's going to be a top, a tough <laughs> opening bell to top there but keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. We'll bring you the opening bell on the other side.
Welcome back to the Morning Brief. I'm Madison Mills alongside Josh Schaefer, and we are live from the NASDAQ in Midtown Manhattan this morning. We're just minutes away from the opening bell here on Wall Street, where our very own team is going to be ringing that opening bell. We have Shauna and Brad, both the Smiths there, winding their way through the NASDAQ to get to the bell to help ring in the start of the trading day here. While we wait for that bell to ring, we are going to hit on some of our top stories and a top trending story from this morning. We're going to focus in on Apple. Their iPhone troubles continue continuing to pressure the tech giant, shipping just over 50 million smartphones in the first three months of the year. That falls short than the nearly 52 million that analysts were expecting, and that's nearly a 10 percent drop from a year ago. Josh, what else are you looking at when it comes to Apple here? Yeah, I mean, Maddie, it feels like with Apple, this wasn't necessarily a surprise in some ways, right? We've been talking about a slowdown in demand for a little bit, and I think that's why you see shares down a little bit today, but not necessarily weighed on significantly, right? Because the stock's already down about 9% this year, so mm. I think some of it may be priced in as far as not great demand to start the year. But I think with Apple, it'll just be interesting to see sort of how they're able to bring in new demand. We know the stock was up last yep. week on a report from Bloomberg that they were adding in AI, potentially adding in AI chips into their Macs to right. sort of bring Mac sales back up. And to me, I think that's one of the biggest looming questions right now with the stock is, okay, how do you bring demand back to some of these products? Because I think a lot of people right now are sitting here with an iPhone hmm. thinking, why do I need a new one, right? right? If you have the iPhone 12, what's really the difference between that and the 14 or the 15? I think it's not quite, the pitch isn't really there for the well, consumer. And it's particularly difficult when you have consumers in China not buying these iPhones mm -hmm. anymore, right? This is obviously a significant portion of the global population. China more aggressively kind of pushing homegrown brands as well. I think about a Xiaomi um, and growth that we're seeing even across other sectors like in Huawei and Alibaba and all of these names. So it's kind of not just an idiosyncratic issue for Apple. This is something that's weighing on some other brands, including Tesla this morning, of mm. course, Lane off 10% of their workforce, according to some reports. So it also leads to a broader markets question about whether or not the MAG-7 is starting to stall here. We are about a minute away from the opening bell on Wall Street, where Yahoo Finance is ringing that opening bell at the NASDAQ. And as we were just saying, Josh, looking at some of these big tech names here, it does appear like we're going to maybe open... It looks, like we're, it looks like we're going to open in the green, Maddie, which is a good way to start a Monday, a good way to start the week, right? We green. saw we saw futures move up a little bit after that retail sales print this morning. Yep. Looks like we're shaking off some of the conflict in the Middle East, at least thus far. And look at that. Look at look that. at our friends down at the close or at the opening bell we've on got, Wall Street. We've got our incredible Yahoo Finance team reigning in the opening bell this morning. Great to see all of those familiar faces and just really kind of points to the broader growth that we're having here at Yahoo Finance. A lot of exciting things going on in terms of our content, our brand new studio, and all of the new shows that we have coming up. And there <laughs> is our CEO, Tapan. Uh, ringing the opening bell for us this morning alongside some of our co-anchors here. So it's just great to see everyone ringing in that opening bell and getting some of the recognition for a lot of the hard work that we've all been putting in over the past year as we've sort of relaunched our brand new studio and we have all of these new shows, new series coming in, and really the coverage that's come along with that. So I'm thrilled to be part of the team as a newer member and it's just really cool to get to be at the NASDAQ while the team's Bringing the opening bell, Josh. So. Yeah, bringing in a new era, fresh new look for the website, which I suggest everyone goes and checks out, right? Finance.yahoo.com. It looks absolutely excellent. Well, speaking of that website, we are going to give you some more advice for your portfolio building using our very own tools on the Yahoo Finance platform. We have our own Jared Blickery standing by with a check of the markets at the open for that. Jared? Thank you, Maddie. We are beginning this week with some green on the screen. The NASDAQ is up 55 basis points, but that's not even the leader. The Dow here almost up 1%. And let's see, that's worth 358 points, and that's falling uh, 500 points uh, the week before and we've seen some pressure in the market recently some of this has caught it caught, come about from elevated bond yields and we'll take a look at those in a second but first I want to show the sector action industrials in the forefront today followed by financials we're still getting some of those big bank earnings that we're, we we get rolling in the materials we also see utilities healthcare and staples lots of broad-based action here but tech XLK actually the least good off here and let's see what our leaders are looking at like right 
right here. Uh, Chinese internet stocks, KWeb is up 1.44%. That's in the driver's seat here. Uh, gambling in transportation taking a little bit of a backseat, also crypto. But let's take a look at inside the NASDAQ 100. Apple, we're going to be talking about that in a second after two big days last week. Uh, not really seeing any continuation, seeing we're down about 1% today. Also seeing some strength in the other mega caps here, but nothing up more than 1%. NVIDIA just ticking up there. And I want to close with a look at the banking sector. We did get those Goldman Sachs earnings. And look at that, 5.48%. That is a lot for Goldman Sachs. And I'll just show you a five-year chart here at the upper end of its long-term trading range. Guys. All right, Jared, thank you so much for joining us on that. We're going to move to our trending tickers, picking up where you left off with Goldman Sachs shares rising after the bank reported earnings this morning that surpassed the street's expectations really across the board here, uh, reporting a 28% jump in profits from a year ago. And Josh, this was a $1 billion beat when mm. it comes to the uh, revenue and the, and the overall picture for Goldman here. So just really indicative that over the past year, they have sort gotten it together when it comes to some yeah. of the challenges they're and, and facing. Scrolling through the release, it's always good for a company and you see big stock moves like this when you see multiple metrics beating, right? You mentioned revenue beating and then you also see net income beating. You see sort of a revival in their deal making business overall, which has been mm -hmm. a concern, right? And I think zooming out, perhaps maybe just a good indicator here for deal making in the broader on Wall Street, right? And sort of thinking about what it means for the health of deal making and if we're going to start to see a little bit of a pickup there because we know Goldman has been one of the banks that has sort of been hampered by that, right? Mm -hmm. Just the fact that we've seen less M&A, we've seen less IPOs, we've seen less things that investment banking are, are involved in. Yeah. And so at some point that slowdown hits your business, right? If you start to see a little bit of an upturn, maybe we're getting some sort of indicator here that we're going to see an upturn from a broader perspective, which yeah. would be welcome for yeah. investors. Well, it's a really good point, and it also speaks to some of the upticks that we've seen not only in deal making, but also, of course, in the IPO market. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking IPOs, we got to talk about Reddit because we have a slew of investment banks initiating coverage on that name today. We have Needham rating Reddit as a buy with a target price of $55. We also have Deutsche Bank giving the stock a buy rating with a $50 price target, but not all firms are bullish on this stock. We have Goldman and J. JP Morgan, both placing the equivalent of a neutral rating on Reddit as valuation and the path to monetization still remain a concern for this name. Josh, I know that you have spent a lot of time kind of covering what's going on with Reddit and yeah. the IPO. What are your sources telling you about it? Yeah, so I mean, the stock is back at about $41 now. So it's sort of out of the range that a lot of people were concerned with when you saw that big surge in Reddit right out of the gate, right? Reddit shares were up over $70. And I think there was a lot of hesitation from investors of just, oh wow, everyone sort of bought the AI trade here instantly. And while there may be AI upside, AI upside is not coming in this first quarterly earnings report, right? And so it's gonna take a little bit of time. I think that was something interesting looking through some of the different Wall Street research that was released today as these firms initiate coverage on the stock a lot of people talking about the Gen, I, uh, Gen AI upside, right? right? And sort of that is the value prop here. That is gonna be the growth metric to watch is how can they monetize that? Mm -hmm. And it seems like right now people just are have a little bit of differing opinions, if you will, on whether or not that's gonna happen. Because for now, Reddit isn't really monetizing AI mm. at a high clip. Most of their money is coming from advertising. Mm, it's a really good point. And I finally got on Reddit, by the way, so I feel like I'm, oh, you gotta check it out. I'm helping the stock, of yes. course, this morning. But a stock that's not doing so great this morning. Trump media shares plunging after the company filed to issue millions of additional shares of stock. Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman joining us with more. Rick. Hey guys, right, so there's an SEC filing from this company, ticker symbol DJT, saying that it's gonna issue another 21.5 uh, million shares of stock. Not the best timing for that. I mean, it's way, this, this stock is way below its uh, IPO price. I think it got as high as $79. Uh, it looks like it's now down 10% or so today. Uh, to around $29. Uh, when you issue more stock, I mean, the, you know, basically people will buy the stock and money will go back to the company, but the value of the existing shares gets diluted. So this just raises further questions about whether this company, which is the parent company of True Social, is just a GoFundMe campaign for Donald Trump, or does it have any actual business prospects? I also want to talk to you about some other news going on with the former president this morning as he heads to a court in Manhattan. Talk to us about that trial today. So for, for everybody who's lost track, 
Uh, there have been two civil cases uh, going against Donald Trump. Those are basically over and at this point of appeal. There are four criminal trials, and this is the first one that's actually going to get started. So this is going, this trial is going to rehash a lot of what we already know about payments, the so-called hush money payments uh, Donald Trump and his company made to Stormy Daniels to cover up the affair that happened eons ago. Uh, so the New York City District Attorney has said that those were, uh, those, th there's business fraud involved here because those were disguised as company payments and accounted for as something that they weren't. So it's really a question of, did Trump commit business fraud uh, in the manner in which he, uh, he made those payments? This is probably going to take about uh, six weeks, but we are going to have a verdict. Uh, this is the important thing. We are going to have a verdict, barring something unforeseen, in at least one of these four criminal trials uh, before the election. If Trump is guilty, there's no doubt he will appeal, but at least we're going to have an outcome in one trial. Rick, thank you so much for joining us on that news this morning. We're going to have all of your markets action ahead right here on Yahoo Finance. So stay tuned for more after the break. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. You're looking at footage from just minutes ago when Brad and I were downstairs doing a first for me the second time for Brad, ringing the opening bell at the NASDAQ. How cool is that? It was so cool. I mean, they caught me in that shot right there, remembering that my mic was still on me, so I had to figure out what to do there. But ultimately, the funfetti went off. You know we love to see it. 
especially on a Monday where everybody could use a little funfetti in your life. And we had plenty of Yahoo Finance fun down there at the NASDAQ opening bell this morning. We were doing our best cheering. I it's saw you doing time. it. It is a long time. It's yeah, it requires a lot of stamina. You're right. Like, I remember working here and telling people, <laughs> hey, you need to be able to clap and cheer for a long time. It's longer than you expected. <laughs> and it's not until you're on that stage and you're like, man, I don't think I've clapped for a exactly. minute straight in my life. There was a lot. Until yeah. you do that. Yeah. I know. My hands are still a little bit sore from all the clapping, okay. the cheering, well, once I it rings, the confetti. <laughs> yeah. We've watched it a million times. It still took me by surprise, but certainly it was so much fun and obviously a lot to celebrate here at Yahoo Finance. Let's get to the market action because you are still looking at gains across the board, all three of the major averages opening to the upside. Now, the market looking to rebound from its worst week of the year. So here with more, we want to bring in Brad McMillan. He's Commonwealth Financial Network Chief Investment Officer. Brad, it's great to have you here. So let's talk about the biggest factors that are driving the market right now. We had that hotter than expected or better than expected retail sales print out this morning. Earnings actually looked pretty good out this morning from Goldman Sachs. But then, of course, you have the geopolitical risk, the rising tensions going on right now in the Middle East. How are you evaluating this from a strategist standpoint? Well, Shauna, when you look at what's going on, it's easy to get caught up in the details, but I think we need to focus on two things. First of all is valuations. You know, we've seen interest rates spike a bit, and that's not unexpected, but the market is largely getting, getting its head around. And we saw a couple of bad days, but the valuations are kind of stable where they are. So that means it all comes down to earnings, and that essentially means domestic demand. So I'm keeping an eye, as I have been for a year and a half now, on job growth, on consumer confidence, and the international risks, the real, but they're always there. So I'm not too concerned about them in the short to medium term. Brad, you're, you're one of the second major guests that we've had on to say demand is one of the larger themes to listen for this earnings season. Wh where do you believe that may moderate or what are the key words that investors should zero in on when they listen into any commentary around demand, either in the press release or in the earnings call that takes place thereafter? I think it's about the consumer. I mean, what we've been talking about is we've been talking about consumer concerns. And for example, we saw the Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey pull back a little bit. Now, it's still healthy. It's still up from where it was several months ago. But I think the real question going forward for every company is going to be, how are they doing with the consumer? What are they seeing the consumer buying? And I think that's really what's going to determine where earnings go for this year. Brad, how do you think the Fed is looking at the recent developments here? Because, again, you have another econ data point that's out showing that consumers are still out there spending, even in the face of uncertainty. And then you have the risk that we could see energy prices move to the upside if the tensions in the Middle East were to escalate. So what does that mean for the likelihood of the timing of the first rate cut and how many cuts we will likely see before year end? Well, Sean, I've been saying this for a long time. I think people are asking the wrong question. People are saying, when is the first rate cut? How many rate cuts will there be? I think the right question is, why on earth would the Fed cut rates? Inflation is still high. Job growth, and remember, those are the two statutory priorities. Job growth is still strong. So there's no reason from the Fed's perspective to cut rates. Not only that, when you look at it from a going forward perspective, the more seriously you take, take the risks, the more you have to say, okay, the Fed is going to hold off on cutting so they can keep their powder dry until they really need it. And they don't really need it right now. And so where would the biggest shift take place? And, and whether or not we see rate cuts commence this year or the beginning of next year even, as some economists are wildly revising the six and seven cuts that they had priced in coming into the start of this year. What does that tell you about the time span and the duration of the cuts that we could be looking at once they finally do commence? I don't think we're going to see any rate cuts this year. I would be I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't see any next year. I think there's a real chance. I'm never going to say it's different this time. You know, I've, I've been burned by that before. But when you look at the underlying dynamics of the labor market, I don't see a reason to see the significant pullback in employment that we've seen. And I also don't see a reason why inflation is going to go back down. So as long as employment stays strong, I would say not this year, probably not next year, unless we see a significant pullback, we see a significant collapse in job growth. And that just doesn't seem to be in the cards right now. So, Brad, if we don't get a rate cut this year, if we don't even get one in 2025, what does that then mean for equity action just in terms of 
where how investors should be positioned, where you think makes the most sense, given the fact that there's so much unknown at this point? Well, the thing is, when you look at where return streams are coming from, we've seen most we've seen most equity returns coming from multiple expansion over the past you know several years. We've seen multiple expansion driving it up. Earnings have done okay, but that's not where the juice has been. So we're probably going to see valuations stabilize, but that means we're not going to get the boost from valuations going up. So you have to look at earnings growth. And one of the things that has kept um, the Magnificent Seven running is that they have had both the valuation expansion and the earnings growth. Now, maybe that's starting to change. You look at Tesla, you were looking at Apple, you were just talking about that before the break. You know, that's something where all of a sudden, you're not gonna have that tailwind. It's gonna be a lot more about earnings. And that means we're gonna see a lot more vulnerability. At the same time, when you look at um, stocks like value stocks, typically, or consumer staples driven stocks, that are really driven by the U.S. domestic economy and can respond to that growth with better earnings, that's a better place to be. All right, Brad McMillan, always great to get your perspective here. Thanks so much for hopping on with us this morning. Commonwealth Financial Network's Chief Investment Officer. Thanks, Brad. Let's turn to Tesla. A big story out this morning. Shares of the EV maker, well, they have certainly struggled so far this year, off more than 30% since January 1st. But the big report out this morning that the company is looking to cut costs, potentially laying off or is laying off more than 10% of its global workforce. Yahoo Finance's Press Supermanian has been following this story. Joins us now with the latest on those details. Press. Hey, Shana, what's up? So, yeah, basically, Electrek, the blog, the tech blog, basically had this, they got an email from, or, or secured an email from Elon Musk confirming that 10% of staff are going to be cut at Tesla. He's talking about how they want to set themselves up for the next growth cycle of the company, the layoffs. There were some redundancies there, but they were painful but needed to be done. You know, I can't say that we were surprised here to hear that following their Q1 delivery report where such a massive buildup in supply, something needed to happen here, and I think that's what's going on right now with the stock. You're seeing the reaction there uh, to the downside here, not exactly a positive move. I think we're hearing from Wall Street analysts like Dan Ives telling me that it's an ominous sign for the company to be doing this right now, given the fact that they're navigating this quote-unquote category five sort of uh, storm here with their demand story. I also want to add separately that the, that the electric uh, blog reported that the Cybertruck was actually going to have its production shift length shortened, and that sort of kind of flies in the face of what we've been hearing about demand for that truck, which supposedly is off the hook. So a lot of things happening there in Tesla land right now. Pross, what should investors keep tabs on as we're waiting for more of the details to really develop around this, and, and how do they price it into the stock going forward? You know, I would have expected maybe a, a move to the upside here whenever you hear about other automakers doing sort of similar moves, not to the extent of 10 percent, but I guess it's sort of, it's so extreme that uh, investors are, or maybe Wall Street even a little bit concerned here about the fact that is the demand sort of even worse than what we're hearing? We're going to get earnings from the next week, so we'll have a better idea. Probably going to ask about Cybertruck demand, ask about what the labor sort of story is looking for Tesla right now as it sets up for potentially that Gen 2 vehicle that we, we heard about, and then it kind of went off the table, and now it might be back on. So we'll see what happens next week. All right, Pross, thanks so much for breaking this down or tracking shares of TSLA Tesla here on the day. Thanks so much, Pross. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Taking a look at shares of NVIDIA this morning, the AI chip darling, up more than 2% as city analysts open a 90-day upside catalyst watch on the stock. City sees possible supply chain commentary from chip factory and memory suppliers during earnings, and that specifically as a positive catalyst for the stock here. This is, of course, massive. As we've seen a little bit of profit taking start to emerge in NVIDIA this year and early in the uh, early innings of this year rather it still is a company that could very easily by far shoot beyond expectations that we've seen laid out on the street here I think the street is just looking for more continued catalysts beyond what they've already seen in this earnings season will be and stop me if we've said this before this earnings season will be critical for Nvidia to prove that it still has legs and growing out and capitalizing on even more demand in the past it's been talked about as the de facto AI play and so just trying to cement that further from here yeah exactly and Brad this goes back to it and reminds me of some of the conversations that we've had with analysts that we've had with strategists surrounding NVIDIA over the last several weeks because you're right we have seen a bit of an investment or, or a shift in sentiment when it comes to NVIDIA the stock had fallen just around 10 percent from its recent uh, high there so there was talk just about some of that downward pressure what exactly that could look like then for NVIDIA going forward but City at least coming out saying that they see reason to buy at least for the short, ter short term they are optimistic on the stock now looking out though to the second half of 2024 this year those year-over-year -year comps are going to get more and more difficult and obviously it's tough to continue to post growth numbers anything like Nvidia has posted over the last 12 to 18 months when I mean, you talk about those tougher comps and that's when we're going to get I think a little bit more of that discussion about what exactly the upside really looks like here for Nvidia but City at least finding reason to be optimistic about uh, Nvidia here in the short term and then they also made a call out on Intel as well which also caught my eye because Intel is a stock that's also off nearly 30 percent year to date but City actually Actually, seeing some upside here for Intel over the over the next 30 days, and they're making the case that some of the selling action that they have seen that they that we have seen might be a bit overdone because a lot of that just due to fears surrounding its foundry business, what exactly the timeline looks like there in terms of how long it's going to take to re really see an uptick here in sales going forward. So they're at least positive on Intel for the next 30 days and finding reason to buy. Yeah, one of the huge kind of conversations that's continued to proliferate right now is nationalism among the chip sector. Yeah. Intel, AMD most recently getting hit by that. We saw that a couple days back. That is going to be interesting to see how investors factor in the international equation. And that's where it places even more of the consideration around some of the foreign relations and international business policy. That's going to become even more of a talking point as we get closer to November. Day by day, we're going to hear exactly where candidates line up on that. And that could have the potential to move some of these chip names even further here. It certainly could. All right, we'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Madison Mills will join me right here at the desk at the NASDAQ. We are going to be diving a bit deeper into the market reaction to current geopolitical conflict and give you a report card on the consumer. Plus, we will take another look at big banks now that Goldman Sachs and Charles Schwab are out with their earnings calls. We're going to wrap that up for you next hour. And then you'll be joining me back at our usual studio for the 11 a.m. Eastern Time Hour for Wealth where we help you navigate investing in a volatile market and explain what issues in the commercial real estate market, CRE, what it means for you. Stay tuned. This is Yahoo Finance. It's tax day.
a jam-packed hour focusing on the biggest movers and shakers on Wall Street. This is market domination, and here, every day is game day. We have one hour left until the market close. It's game time for investors to make their final plays. The clock is ticking, and we've got you covered with our quarter-by-quarter -quarter playbook. We're bringing you in on all the market action with step-by-step -step analysis of our biggest trending tickers. And expert insight into the day's biggest headlines. We'll bring you the closing bell and get you to the finish line. This is Market, market Domination. Domination. Tune in daily from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern. Aimed, aimed at trying to send a signal but not inflict serious damage and casualties in Israel. And on the other side, Israel's remarkable success with U.S. help in essentially neutralizing that entire assault leaves us in a situation where potentially, as Biden has suggested, Israel could just take the win and step away. The issue here, though, is that Israel has to judge whether its own deterrence capabilities uh, require them to do some kind of retaliatory action, and if so, at what level of intensity.
For instance, would they consider striking one of the bases inside the territory of Iran from which these attacks were launched? If that were to happen, and that would be against the advice of the U.S. administration, then we could yet move back into this escalation phase. So far, so good. Not over yet. How likely is that escalation, Krishna? So I think you'd need to uh, be sat in that Israeli war cabinet meeting in order to get a really good sense of this. I would say that my own view broadly aligns with that you see traded in the market this morning, which is the risks do seem to be moderating. Um, whether Israel will literally do nothing further beyond what it's already doing, including striking some Hezbollah proxies in Lebanon, or whether they feel that they have to step up, it's not a clear-cut call. I would be pleasantly surprised if Israel felt that it could um, move forward without doing anything. I think something is likely. The question is, can that be managed, uh, including with U.S. pressure, in the direction of um, registering the required deterrence but without escalating things further? Again, odds are, at the moment, that we're on a good track. But I think it's premature to say this thing is is uh, is safe and put to bed. Krishna, what do you think is just the baseline? Let's talk about the risk side of things. Yes, hopefully the situation does not escalate in the Middle East. But what would it be? What would it take to be the catalyst then for a larger pullback? Obviously, we saw a flight to safety in Friday's trading action. What would it take to trigger a certain uh, reaction here in the markets this week? Well, since the very beginning of the conflict in the Mideast with the horrific Hamas terror attack on Israel, uh, the market's central concern, separate from what we all feel uh, as human beings here, is really on whether this conflict escalates to include Iran or not. Because, of course, if that were to be the case, you would get a full-blown conflict between Israel uh, and Iran, then not only would we see much more widespread conflict, but we would also see a direct threat to the Straits of Hormuz, the oil traffic, uh, and much else potentially if this situation got out of hand. So the Biden administration and Europeans and others have been working hard since that, uh, since this crisis began to try to keep it from ending in an end game of a direct confrontation, Iran, Israel. If that were to happen, it would be a far more serious market event than anything that has happened so far and certainly could be associated with a much more uh, macro-significant and market-significant large and sustained move in the price of oil, which right now our own uh, energy analysts suggest has some geopolitical risk premium in it, but is more generally just supported by good fundamentals. Well, you brought up the Strait of Hormuz, so I'm curious, beyond the oil market, is there a potential risk here to trade that investors should be pricing in? And is that already, is that risk already priced into the oil market? So I would say when we think about trade uh, in non-oil uh, commodities and traded goods, uh, the issue is less the Strait of Hormuz itself. It's more coming back to the Red Sea. And as you and your listeners will know well, of course, Iran has already been dialing up the pressure on that front for some while now, uh, using their proxies among the Houthi uh, rebel group in, uh, in Yemen. So at Red Sea, going up to the Suez for traded goods, uh, Hormuz, of course, for energy products. Well, then moving forward, what trade should that thinking initiate for investors who are based here in New York? So I think, you know, unless you're a, a really deep specialist in trading geopolitical risk and commodity markets, uh, you're probably not going to be able to outsmart, you know, the WTI or Brent price in terms of what's sort of what's in or out in terms of uh, political risks of escalation. What I would say is in terms of the general tenor, risk off Friday, risk on Monday, and investors now paying more attention to oil, uh, both from a market, but also from a macro perspective, potentially further complicating, for instance, the inflation picture you know, in the U.S. or Europe. The key thing to really watch is, um, is, this, is this phase of this uh, larger uh, crisis in the Middle East now s slowly drawing to a close, or are we seeing signs that Israel 
and it's Israel really that has to decide where, what the next move is, that Israel feels a need to retaliate directly against Iran, in which case you should expect a further potentially more serious uh, setback in risk appetite on the one hand, an additional and potentially more sustained upward pressure on oil on the other. That's the thing to watch. All right, Krishna, really appreciate that. Really helpful context there. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. That was Krishna Guha, Evercore ISI vice chairman, joining us on the ongoing tensions in the Middle East. Oil prices continuing to fall this morning, shrugging off concerns of heightened geopolitical tension in the region following Iran's attack against Israel this weekend. Still, some analysts expect prices to jump over $100 a barrel. So what impact can we expect this to have on inflation and in turn, the federal Federal Reserve's path moving forward. Joining us now, we have Jason Draho, UBS Global Wealth Management Head of Asset Allocation. Jason, thank you for being here live with us at the NASDAQ this morning. We appreciate it. Uh, I want to pick up on where we left off there. I'm curious from your perspective, is the risk phase that we're seeing in the Middle East starting to draw to a close or is this a start of a whole new realm of risk? Well, we go back to October 7th when uh, Hamas first attacked Israel. So I think we could say we're in you know, an elongated cycle of how this could play out. Uh, and this is just another phase. So I don't think it's either the beginning or the end. I think it's just the reality that investors you know, will have to be dealing with. This, is, this could escalate at any point in time. It's hard to predict. So it's something that I think is a, it's a risk you have to acknowledge. What we've seen for the past six months is it's clearly not impacted financial market performance. Uh, and it's not something that we would think as a base case that this will I mean, escalate or at least seriously disrupt the overall macro picture in the U.S. So it's a risk to monitor, potentially hedge, but it doesn't change, I think, us, for us the overall narrative of the marketplace. Do you think, could it make it, though, more likely that the Fed is going to stay on the sidelines maybe longer than anticipated if we do see a spike in energy prices and then, of course, the pressure that that, the upward pressure that that could potentially put on inflation? Well, if you're looking specifically at oil, historically the Fed has looked through oil price shocks mm -hmm. because, you know, you see oil price spike and then it comes down. We saw that in 21. Uh, we can go back into like 2007 and 8. So the Fed tends to look at it as, as transitory. You know, there's sort of an mm -hmm. saying in the Wall Street that the solution for high commodity prices is high commodity prices. Mm -hmm. So I think the Fed would kind of look through that. They'd focus much more on are the trends in core inflation, services, the labor market, are they trending in the right direction? And wouldn't, it's a headache. Optically, it's a headache if you know, inflation is going higher for them to cut, but I think it doesn't necessarily change their overall strategy. Well, if that is the case, then I'm curious from your perspective, what is more likely? Is it more likely that we're going to have a rise in oil, keeping inflation high, meaning higher for longer, or that geopolitical shocks could potentially put pressure on the economy and lead to a quickening of rate cuts? Well, I think if you need to see a significant spike in oil prices, so like the 120 plus for, for it to really start to, to impact the U.S. economy. Mm. Because, you know, you have to understand the U.S. is now the biggest oil producer in the world. It's about 13 million barrels a day. So as a result, when oil prices go up at these kind of levels in the 80, 90 to $100 a range, the net effect for the U.S. economy overall is somewhat neutral. Certainly worse for the consumer, you're paying more at the pump, but the energy sector production actually offsets some of that from an overall economic activity. So you really have to have a bigger spike for it to start to impact you know, consumer spending for the Fed to think, well, now it's actually going to slow down and therefore to be preemptive, we need to cut. So as where we are in the range right now, it's sort of noise for the market as opposed to like really a tail risk that's kind of escalating. So I think, again, at these levels, it doesn't alter what the Fed's likely to do. So what is your reading then on inflation? Because here we are we're on the heels of three hotter than expected prints. We also got another strong read on the economy this morning when it comes to retail sales. Are you confident that this disinflation trend is going to resume and then continue? I'm not as confident today as I would have been a week ago. Mm -hmm. I think that, that's, I think, an easy thing to say. But if you sort of look at the details of where inflation is likely to go, I have some reason to be a little more confident that it still will continue as a downward trend, bumpy, not necessarily smooth, but the, the, by year end, core inflation will be lower. One thing is if you look at the core CPI X shelter, it's 2.4%. With shelter, it's 3.8%. Then if you look at sort of real-time data on rents, it's all indicating that the shelter piece will continue to go down. The other thing that when people talk about inflation be accelerating, no one's talking about how there could be a wage price spiral because if you look at the labor market and wage inflation, almost every single measure is going to lower. Average hourly earnings, the Atlanta Fed you know, kind of wage tracker, the employment cost index, they're all suggesting wage is going to moderate. That doesn't mean price inflation is going to go lower. Um, you know, the relationship is a little bit loose. But it's hard to see inflation reaccelerating if wage growth continues to moderate as it has. Mm -hmm. So the trend to me is, is inflation will continue to come lower. It's just maybe not going to be as smooth as quickly as investors were anticipating, you know, three months ago. In that dynamic, what will drive more growth for equity markets when we have such record-breaking valuations? I mean, I think if you look at you know, where GDP could be tracking after the retail sales, it could be close to 3% in Q1. You have 3% inflation or more, that's 6% nominal GDP. 
Mm. No change in margin, you're talking about 6% kind of you know, potential revenue growth. And then if you get any margin expansion, then you can be looking at high single digit you know, earnings growth, especially in the tech sector, which is more of a micro idiosyncratic story, like with AI, the same thing in healthcare with some of the obesity drugs. So you have a macro story that could be relatively favorable, but you also have these secular thematic tailwinds. Mm. So all of it suggests you know, earnings should kind of grow relatively robustly this year. It would really take something, again, inflation, you know, being sticky, really accelerating, that takes the Fed completely off the table. Maybe you have rate hikes be a possibility. I think that's the thing that would be the, the most difficult for the markets to, to deal with at this point in time. Jason, when you take a look at the action in the bond market, you have yields heading back higher once again today. What do you think that action is going to look like? Are we going to remain range bound? Could we retest that 5% level? So I think our range would be like for the 10 year around four to four and a half percent. So we're clearly we're breaching that a little bit mm -hmm. higher. To go much higher, to go back to the 5%, you start to, I think, not only have to price out you know, rate cuts this year, but also next year, and even kind of bring back the possibility, could the Fed have to hike again? There's been a pretty good relationship, it's not perfect, between where the tenure is and where the market is pricing for the terminal Fed funds rate, kind of looking out a few years. Meaning, is the Fed going to be able to cut 10 times ultimately in this cycle, or only three or four? If it ends up being the latter, well then, you know, maybe you go back to kind of you know, 5% on, on a tenure. I think what happened last October is when you got to 5%, a lot of investors who were saying, like, I'd rather sit in cash. Now if you can lock in at 5% in a tenure, given the fact that the Fed is very close to cutting rates, that's a pretty attractive bid in the market. So whether we get to 5% or 475, I think, you know, sometimes you can just have short-term momentum, but I think there's going to be a lot of resistance for rates to go much higher, unless you, we really fundamentally we alter what we think where the economy is headed in over the next few years. All right, Jason Dreho, great to have you here in uh, person with us at the NASDAQ, UBS Global Wealth Management Head of Asset Allocation. Thanks so much, Jason. Thank you. Well, retail sales coming in hotter than expected for the month of March, rising seven tenths of a percent. February's number also arised to the upside for an increase of nine tenths of a percent. So what does this tell us about the state of the consumer? Clearly very resilient. Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma is here to tell us the latest on that. Joining us now with some of the trends that we're seeing, Brooke. Good morning, Shauna. Absolutely seeing a resilient U.S. consumer here based upon those March retail sales number. As sticky inflation and higher interest rates is not deterring the U.S. consumer from continuing to shop at a faster than expected rate. Taking a closer look at those numbers, we did see them coming up 0.7 percent compared to estimates of up 0.4 percent. And this is now the second consecutive monthly uptick in retail sales, once again indicating that the U.S. consumer remains resilient and does remain strong. Now, breaking down the report, we did see an increase in gas prices that led to the headline number coming in higher. We also did see an increase in spending as far as online shopping, general merchandise, as well as at restaurants and bars. And this is a key indicator that could impact the Fed's decision to wait longer to cut interest rates. And we heard from Roth MKM chief economist Michael Darda this morning that said that the Fed eventually will get around to lowering policy rates and easing this year. But they'll be very reluctant to start that process until it's really much more obvious that the economy is losing steam here. Once again, U.S. retail sales coming in hotter than expected for the month of March. And there's also a slew of earnings this week that could give us a closer inside look at the state of the U.S. consumer, including earnings from Bank of America, as well as credit card companies, American Express and Discover, in addition to CPG giant Procter & Gamble, all those giving us a closer, deeper dive inside look at the state of the U.S. consumer. Back to you, Shauna. All right, Brooke, thanks so much for breaking that down for us. We're going to get to another big story that we're watching, and that's the Biden administration making another move to bolster chip production here in the U.S. We know it has certainly has been a priority for the administration. Well, now Samsung is going to receive up to $6.4 billion in U.S. grants to build chip-making facilities in Texas. Now, more specifically, Samsung is expected to invest $40 billion itself in this project. It's going to build new plants in Taylor, Texas, which is just northwest of Austin, Texas. It also is planning to expand the company's existing plant in Austin. And this will be for chips that, that are involved in many aspects of this new technology when it comes to AI, when, even when it comes to medical devices like pacemakers, so really critical here for future technological innovation. And again, just the latest move here from the Biden administration, really doubling down and doing all it can to bring more chip manufacturing back here to the U.S. Well, and members of the Biden administration already kind of hopping on that talking point this morning, though, in accuracy, they, they talk about Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo on a call this morning saying that this does put the U.S. on track to hit their goal of producing 20 percent of the world's leading chips in the U.S. just by the end of the 
decade that's coming up here uh, and saying also that this is going to be a boon to the local economy. It's expected to create 17,000 construction jobs and more than 4,500 manufacturing jobs. So also that was a reminder to me this isn't just about the U.S. having the power when it comes to chips production, but also the economic power behind getting involved in this space. Yeah, I remember earlier this year the Biden administration announcing grants to TSMC for a large manufacturing project in Arizona, also recently announcing uh, the deal with Intel funding for Intel for plants in Arizona, Ohio, New Mexico, and Oregon. All right, keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. Coming up, NASDAQ co-president Nelson Griggs is going to join us for his take on the IPO market, what to expect going forward. You won't want to miss that. We'll be right back. The IPO market is on the road to recovery with the Renaissance IPO ETF rising nearly 40% in the last year, outpacing gains that were seen in the S&P 500. Companies like Astera Labs leading the hype up over 20% since its public debut. That was back in March, and this comes as investors continue to double down on AI. For more on the IPO market, we're joined by Nelson Griggs. He's NASDAQ's co-president and alongside our very own executive editor, Brian Sazi. Thank you both for being here this morning. Nelson, I do want to start with some of the news that happened this weekend that we've been talking about all morning here. And I'm curious from your perspective, do geopolitical risks have any impact on the IPO market? 
Typically, no. Uh, usually, you'll see a, a short-term shock. We'll see how it, it plays out over time. If it obviously got uh, in, increasingly more serious, certainly you could have an impact on the markets. I think the biggest thing people are watching is what happens to oil prices. You know, we have some inflation data that it kind of ticked up. Does that carry forward to that? But I think overall, you see the geopolitical environment not dramatically impacting uh, the, the IPO market. What are companies waiting for to go to public? What are the companies waiting for? That's a great question. So I think what we're looking for is the market started to build a bit at the end of last year. You had companies' financials go stale, so they had to do some resetting in the February time frame. And now we have the market conditions for them. We have investor sentiment uh, you know, stronger towards IPO markets with the ones that have gone out do fairly well. So I think we're just in this building phase of the more companies go in, in April and May and do well, then we, uh, we're anxious for a back half of the year, a little bit more pickup. But there's still this, uh, you know, I, I need to get a bit bigger to be a public company than we saw in 2020 and 21. Nelson, how much more pickup are you expecting in the second half of the year? Uh, that's great. We, I wish I had the answer to that. I, I'd say we, we do see the pipeline building. We have about 156 companies that are in file to go public versus 146 last year. But there's a good clean out last year, some that really were not going to go public. So we have seen a pretty dramatic build of companies that would like to go public. I think we just have to see these companies that do go out now do well, and then the investors will be excited to, to participate. I think Jamie Dimon brought up a good point in his annual letter uh, a week or so ago, Nelson, that companies may not want to go public because of the regulatory backdrop. When you're out there meeting with potential IPO candidates, what do they tell you about this? Well, I've, I've been at this for uh, over 20 years now, and I think that has been a, a discussion point for that entire time. And I, I do feel that companies of a certain maturity level have, there's a process to go public. The financial requirements reporting are well known. So I don't see that being a, a really large impediment, although companies do have to be prepared for it. And we have a lot of tools and services to help them do that, but at, at the end of the day, I don't see that being the, the biggest impediment. It's really market sentiment. Companies do want to go public. They want to have liquid uh, currency, so it's it's not a top top priority or concern. It seems like kind of a talking point. I know you're not going to yeah. say that, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I'll say sure, it. But sure. It's always good to blame the regulatory environment when you're really just waiting for interest rates to come down. Yeah, I, no, I'd, I'd agree with that. So I, I think the regulatory environment, uh, companies have gotten used to what that means. The auditors gotten used to what that means. So you had Sarbanes-Oxley was going to kill the IPO market. And we obviously saw a pretty good resurgence over the years. There's always this next thing that might kill the IPO market, but it does come down to investors' interest in IPOs and companies wanting to take the risk in a new company and how have really the previous class done. We have this IPO uh, sentiment index we put out, and it takes – really five or six factors together, and it is a great environment now to think about going public. So I think IPO winners are real. When the market is there and ready to go, companies need to go. But uh, we did have a, a kind of a multi-year reset for what it means to be a public company. When some of these companies ultimately come out of this uh, pipeline, Nelson, are we going to hear about AI? Or is every single company some AI company with a $10 billion plus market cap? Yeah, I think that, that's a great question. I was out on the West Coast two, two weeks ago. I think most companies that go public will have an AI component and talk about how they're leveraging AI, either for efficiencies or new offerings. I think, think the pure play AI companies in this new world of generative AI are probably still several years away because they, they're, they're newer. So I think there, there's no way you're not going to hear AI a couple hundred times. So we're just getting a taste. We're just getting a taste. Yeah, Everything is AI. But what is happening in that, in that field is absolutely remarkable. We're seeing a, an enormous amount of VC money go into the AI offerings. And, and whether it's, again, a, a pure play, software, hardware, what have you, it's, 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 attract, it's a new, massive new age enabler to get more companies to be more efficient and to grow. So it's exciting. Nelson, in addition to AI, are there any other common themes or common factors that you've noticed in your recent conversations just about companies that are thinking about going public? What is top of mind for business leaders right now and maybe what that could signal here over the next several months? Yeah, it really is that consistency of revenue. I think most companies are looking at being a bit larger than they would have looked at being a couple years ago. So that consistency of annual recurring revenue. And they obviously got the message loud and clear these last few years. And investors are also looking at either profitability or a path to profitability. So I think just the business dynamic as companies thought about what investors want, which can change you know, quickly, uh, has, has moved towards that reoccurring revenue and a path to, to profitability. Thanks for letting us ring the bell today. I appreciate oh, it. Oh, man. That was, was so fun. Much fun. Was that was fun. You, guys, you guys brought it. You guys brought it. A lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm. Yeah. That's what we do here, y'all. Finance. Like, well, there's a lot of clapping. My yeah, hands are still recovering from yeah, all It the tingles clapping. for like at least two minutes <laughs> afterwards, right? But you guys have been an amazing partner to us at, at NASDAQ. I'm really thrilled to, to work more with Yahoo Finance. Appreciate a lot it. of fun. And we're uh, really excited to be hosting the shows here uh, at least this morning. So thanks so much. Thank cool. you, Nelson, for taking the time to join us here. And of course, to Sazi as well. Great to be here.
All right, keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got much more of your market action ahead. Again, you're looking at gains across the board all through the major averages starting the week trading into the upside. We'll be right back. Goldman Sachs, share, Goldman Sachs shares trading to the upside today. That comes after they kicked off Q1 earnings with better than expected profits, rising 28% compared to last year. To break down how banks are faring during, during this earnings season, we have Brennan Hawken, UBS Senior Equity Research Analyst, joining us. Brennan, thanks so much for being here. I do want to start on that Goldman push to the upside. What would you say is the single biggest contributing factor to their success, given the challenges that we know we've had throughout the past? year here yeah hi good morning thanks for having me um the uh sorry about that the uh, uh what i would say at goldman is capital markets recovery right i mean they they have been struggling with exiting the consumer business that was really an issue for most of 2023 uh that's largely behind they just finished selling green sky which was the last real transaction that needed to happen and at this point we've got opening capital markets, we've got investment banking picking back up, we've got continued volatility in the markets that's driving an 8% return on equity in the GBM business, the global banking and markets business at Goldman. That's their strongest and largest franchise, and that's really what drove the better than expected results. So, Brendan, taking that into account, the fact that we have seen a bit of a shift just in terms of what Goldman is focusing on now, clearly it looks like that shift is paying off. What does that then tell us maybe about some of those growth numbers that you're expecting to see from Goldman in the coming quarters? 
Yeah, I mean, I think this is where it comes down to with investors how much they can make now that the environment's starting to get better. Uh, they had laid out an efficiency ratio target of right around 60%. This quarter, they did 61. Uh, they've been targeting mid-teens return on common, tangible common throughout the organization. This quarter, they did 16. Now, the first quarter is typically a seasonally strong quarter for investment banking. So we shouldn't take this and run rate it, but it shows that they've repositioned this franchise in order to continue to drive earnings and continue to drive growth. We're above consensus next year in the low 40s in earnings. And really, I think it's my sense investors are more thinking that that number can more move to the mid 40s and continue to drive the stock higher uh, as we continue to see more and more encouraging signs of this improvement and recovery in capital markets come through. Right, and when we talk about the fact that maybe the Fed is going to stay on the sidelines for longer than initially anticipated, we got the, another strong uh, retail sales printout this morning. Obviously, the recent inflation prints that we've gotten pointing to the fact that consumer prices remain more elevated than maybe an initially anticipated. What does that mean then for a name like Goldman? Well, you got interest rates that are going to remain high. Uh, what we think actually, and this has been a debate that often comes up around Goldman, is what's the right way to think about trading? Trading is such a big part of their business. To me, the constant debate and consideration around what's, when's the Fed going to move? When does inflation ease? What does that mean to the rate market? All that just adds more volatility to the markets. Volatility drives volume when you're thinking about trading businesses. These are a good thing. And when you think about the period prior to COVID, we had a decade of basically zero interest rate policy. That suppresses volatility. And so you have investors that look back on that period of a decade, and it's really not relevant, and it's really not a good comparison because we had volatility effectively suppressed by central banks around the world. Now we're in a period where central banks are diverging. They're not completely sure about how to deal with this, this inflation and whether or not they really have it under control. The strength of the economy has been really robust. And so you have elevated volatility, strong economic outlook, and, and really strength, continuing to strengthen economic outlook. Uh, all of those are really, really positive for investment banks. And now you have Goldman with a far more clean, far more focused strategy. Really, you know, to me, it's a, it's a, no, it's a, it's a very clear winner uh, in this environment. And it hasn't, it's been an okay stock. It hasn't been a great stock. I think actually moving forward, Goldman makes a ton of sense from here. I'm curious about any downside risks to that view, particularly I'm thinking about market share taking from some of these big banks uh, due to the demise of Credit Suisse and also private asset managers folding as they face higher for longer rates and they don't have the capital to keep up. To what extent is that risk something that's going to be hitting these names six months to a year from now, or has that risk already been priced in? Well, I mean, about Credit Suisse, uh, I'm not going to say too much because now they're actually our colleagues here at UBS. Um, but they, when, when a company gets into, when a financial company gets into distress, you know, the, the counterparties pull back way before the actual event takes place that that results in uh, resolution. And so I, I think that actually really was much more of a 2023 story. If we stop and take a step back and think about, you mentioned the sponsors. Actually, I, I asked uh, David Solomon about this on the call today. Their investment banking business actually is really, really large with the sponsor community. So their M&A business, they do a lot. And what does that mean? They do a lot of work with private equity firms. Private equity firms have been really, really quiet recently. We've begun to start to see the levered loan market pick back up. That finances a lot of their deals. That will help. Um, and so while this quarter was good, there are still big parts of their business that haven't fully recovered and are still on the calm. And so that to me is why I think we can continue to think about an earnings recovery story, continue to think about solid earnings outlook and solid growth from here. Uh, and there's still a, a pretty solid path to higher earnings, especially when we're thinking about 2025 and beyond. Of course, there's always, always risks, though, oh. to answer your question. So, sorry, I realized I didn't answer your risk question. It's an investment bank. They take risks. There's always risks in an investment bank without a doubt. Yeah. <laughs> Brendan, we got to leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us here, breaking down the Thank latest you. that we're hearing from Goldman, as well as uh, the other larger players within the financial space. Brendan Hawken, UBS, a senior equity research analyst. Thanks. Well, coming up, we've got much more of your market action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
The bond sell-off intensifying in today's action. Taking a look at yields shooting to the upside. You've got the 10-year right around 4.65. You've actually got the two-year just shy of that 5% level. Now, the move higher in yields coming as investors continue to push out their bets on rate cut timing, expecting maybe we're not going to see the Fed cut clearly as early as June. Now there's talk about we might not even see a rate cut before the end of the year. Here to break it all down is Michael Kantopoulos. He is director of fixed income at Richard Bernstein Advisors. Michael, it's great to have you here. So talk to us just about your reaction in the spike higher that we've seen in yields with the two-year just below that 5% level. Yeah, you know, this isn't really surprising to us. Um, when we came into 2024, one of the big themes at RBA was that we were going to see higher rates rather than lower rates, um, that the market was quite frankly being absolutely ridiculous in pricing in six cuts for the year. Um, we couldn't believe that back then they were pricing in a cut for March. I mean, growth is quite strong in the U.S. Uh, when you look at most of the economic indicators out there, they bottomed roughly a year ago, whether that be leading economic indicators, PMIs, durable goods orders, industrial production. You look at market-based measures like credit spreads, uh, copper, you know, they're all sort of breaking out, or in the case of spreads, breaking lower. You look at lending standards, they've loosened. I, I mean, there's really zero reason for the Fed to hike from a growth, per, or excuse me, cut from a growth perspective. And then you throw on inflation, and it's a whole nother ball of wax. And, and there's just really, in our view, very little chance that they're going to be cutting anytime soon. And the market will probably have to price in a hike at some point again. When would you anticipate that, Michael? Well, I, I think it's going to take a little bit of time before investors fully recognize uh, that eventuality. M my guess is once you get past you know June or July and you start overlapping the lows in inflation, which really were on a year-over-year -year basis in, in June of last year, I, I think you're going to see the market start to say, wow, inflation is not slayed. We're not going back down to 2%. Economic growth is actually accelerating. Housing prices are going up, which have a direct effect on owner's equivalent rent, OER. Uh, OER is about a third of CPI, and that was supposed to be the driver uh, to bring us lower inflation and more towards the 2% mandate this year. And in fact, what it's going to end up being is it's going to be a headwind to inflation as home prices are actually going back up. OER is also going up. And so I think you're going to really start to feel that pretty much from now through the summer. And again, as you start to overlap the lows on a year-over-year -year basis come June and July, uh, you know you could easily see three and a half or high three percent inflation again. We're not talking, you know, five, six, or seven percent inflation, but you could be talking mid threes, and that's nowhere close to two. And I think at that point, investors are going to have to start thinking about tighter policy rather than easier policy. Michael, talk to me just about the odds of this happening. When you weigh the next move here from the Fed potentially being a rate hike, how much more likely do you see that rather than their next move being a rate cut? Well, I, I, I put the odds as um, not so much that I think they will hike as much as I think that you know the market will start to price in some probability of a hike, which is meaningful from a market perspective, both from a credit perspective as well as from an equity perspective. Whether or not they actually get to that point is a different story. But I do think, and you already saw it last week or so, two weeks ago, several Fed officials out there talking about no no cut in 2024, and that if the data continues to to show an increase in inflation, that they may have to start thinking about tightening policy again. So I sometimes just the, the act of talking about it can do the, the Fed's work for themselves. So you know maybe it's a 20% chance it's a hike. Maybe it's a 50% chance of a hike. I don't know if that's necessarily the right question to be asking, because the process of getting to the point where it's even a cons you know considered is what's important and what will start to move markets. Yeah, Michael, with that in mind, then I guess when we talk about the move higher that we could potentially see in the 10-year yield, how much higher do you see that potentially going as the market does maybe begin to price in what could eventually be or could potentially be a risk here for the market when we talk about the fact that the Fed might not be cutting now for quite some time? Yeah, well, I mean, listen, I think, um, you know, you could definitely see 5% before you see 4%. I think that's sort of a for foregone conclusion at this point, given we're at 4.6%. So maybe that's not so novel of a statement anymore. Could you get higher than that? You absolutely could get higher than 5%, particularly 
when you start to think about global factors, you know, coming from Japan, for example, um, you know, if you get a spike in oil prices, if you get supply concerns again with respect to treasury issuance, there's a lot of exogenous factors that could affect interest rates to the upside, in addition to a lot of the fundamental factors on inflation and growth that we just spoke about. So I, I easily see 5% um, you know, before we see 4%, as I mentioned. Would it surprise me if we got to five and a quarter or five and a half? It wouldn't. The one other thing I'll just, I'll just note is that depending on how fast this happens, it's either, you know, it might not be great for the S&P at a market level, but that underlying growth is actually quite bullish from a big part of the market. Industrials, energy, materials, even small caps, if their earnings growth outstrips the move in interest rates, which is what we expect at RBA, then it actually is quite bullish from an equity market perspective, but you have to know where to invest within equities. Quite bearish for credit, if you ask me. Mm. All right, Michael, we're going to have to have you back on soon to dive into that comment more. We could have spent another hour on that. Michael, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Really appreciate it. That was Michael Kontopoulos, and he is the director of fixed income at Richard Bernstein Advisors. Now, coming up, we're going to continue to have all of your markets action ahead, plus what this market might be thinking in response to Iran attacking Israel this weekend. That's coming up after the break. Israel's military says that over 99% of projectiles fired from Iran on Saturday night were intercepted by Israel and its partners as well. While minimal damage was inflicted, the world is now waiting to see what type of response Israel will have and what impact it could have on markets if a larger regional war spreads. And according to some reports from Axios this morning, Israel defense ministers told the Pentagon that they have no choice but to reality to re retaliate rather to help with this analysis we have cliff Kupchin, chairman of the eurasia group and cliff i just want to get your reaction to that news i just mentioned this is reporting according to axios that the israeli defense minister did say they have no choice but to reality retaliate what do you make of that i think they're right they have no choice but to retaliate iran responded uh, in a way that kind of reset the bar they fired Lots of stuff, 300 projectiles of different sorts from their own territory. That is a game changer for Israel in that Iran has shown a much increased willingness to use force. To reestablish deterrence on the Israeli side, 
they have to do something. Now, I think what they will do will be to try to send de-escalatory messages. I don't think they'll do much, but they, they, they have to attack. When you talk about they have to attack, I know you're saying that you don't think that they will do much, but more specifically, what do you think that looks like? And do you think it could be enough to maybe unnerve uh, sorry, the fact that not, not only... I can't hear you. Can you hear me now, Cliff? Do you got me? Cliff, do you have us? All right, we're going to be uh, trying to work out some sound issues we're having with Cliff. We're going to try to reestablish connection. We'll take a quick break and we'll be right back. Let's do a check of the markets. Just about 90 minutes into the trading day, you're still looking at gains, at least for the Dow and the S&P. You can see the Nasdaq flipping into negative, Tori. This comes as investors digest the latest retail sales print that came in very strong here for the latest reading. That's having a real impact on the market here this morning. Also, coupling that with the Goldman earnings that we got out this morning, better than expected. And also the fact that, at least for now, it seems like investors at least remaining confident that the escalation that we saw over the weekend over in the Middle East at least will remain contained for now. So again, you're still looking at a mixed picture, but the Dow at least holding on to gains up just around 86. Well, as we wrap up this hour, we want to check in with Brad Smith. He made his way back to the studios to give us a look here. Brad, what's going on? I can't even read what you're just holding up there. I put tax day on it. Happy face, smiley face, okay. but it didn't pick up on the camera. We'll try it again. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to work. I should have used the Sharpie. I knew it. Times Square. Let's I was going to say Sharpie next time. I Sharpie next time. <laughs> yes. Lessons learned here. All right. Well, there's a lot of lessons learned in the mix for a lot of people filing for taxes before we close out. We got to think about what's coming up in today's show. First and foremost, we're going to see how to recession proof your retirement planning, plus, how to geopolitical tension proof your own portfolio. Plus, we're going to dive into some of those hotter than expected retail sales numbers. And then, of course, as I mentioned and as I tried to write down on my piece of paper here, let's see if I get it closer. Still not working. Anyway, tax day. Uh, happy face, smiley face, and uh, frowny face is what I wrote down. We're going to dive into all the tools, tips, and tricks you need to grow your money. We can't wait for that. Brad has you guys for the next hour. But before we close out, we just wanted to say a quick thank you to the NASDAQ for hosting us here this morning. We had a great time ringing the opening bell as Yahoo Finance celebrates a number of milestones. Make sure to check out our brand new homepage with new advanced charts and also easier ways to track your investments. That's at yahoofinance.com. That does it for us this morning. Thanks so much for tuning in. Brad has you for the next hour. We'll see you tomorrow.
Welcome to Wealth, everyone. I'm Brad Smith, and this is Yahoo Finance's newest guide to building your financial footprint. Our community of experts will give you the resources, the tools, the tips, and the tricks that you need to grow your money. On today's show, evaluating your portfolio to account for geopolitical risks and the stronger than expected retail sales report. Just because consumers like you are out there spending, it doesn't mean that there aren't big savings to be found in key categories and shopping aisles. Plus, is it tax filing deadline day? Yes, it is, everyone. April 15th, we've hit it. We'll tell you what to do if you haven't filed yet. All that and much more on today's show. Let's kick off with a market check. The Dow and the S&P 500 higher, but reversing some of their more extensive earlier gains here, pairing some of those gains here and moving to the flat line here is the move higher coming on the heels of a better than expected retail sales report and strong earnings from Goldman Sachs. The markets, though, also shrugging off some fears over an escalation of the conflict in the Middle East. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery is tracking this. He's got a deeper breakdown of where your money is moving in the market today right now, Jared. Thank you, Brad. And just looking behind me, you can see it's a mixed board in the U.S. We got the Dow, S&P 500 slightly in the green, and the Nasdaq just in the red. Russell 2000 down about half a percent there. I want to get a quick check of the bond market because something interesting is happening. The 10-year T-note yield is up 13 basis points to the highest point in 2024. Um, This has traditionally, when it moves up very quickly, that is weight on stock. So we will see if that uh, happens today. But it also could simply engender some kind of rotation. Now, the leading sector today, XLV in the upper left, that is healthcare. Real estate, the biggest loser, they're down 1%. But we're interested in retail sales today, and we got two sectors that deal with that. XLP, that's staples, that's the stuff you need. You get it at Walmart. XLY, that's the stuff you really want, and that could be a new car, that could be Tesla, that's one of the biggest components, and also Amazon as well. So kind of a mixed board there. And let's get into some different retail stocks. I'm going to go to our heat map here. And you can see a mixed board. The larger players largely in the green. If I sort this by performance, you can see actually more red than green. And we have Wayfair down 5%. We got Nordstrom down also about 4 or 5%. So all in all, not seeing the retail reaction that you might suspect on a day when we have these outsized gains in the underlying economic report. Yeah, Jared, a lot to keep tabs on. Thanks so much for getting us that live look in on what's moving right now. Also, everyone... Markets tracking tensions in the Middle East. They're escalating, but Wall Street's worries seem to be fading after Iran launched its first direct attack on Israel from its soil over the weekend. And while minimum da- minimal damage was inflicted, the world is now waiting to see what type of response Israel will have and what impact it might have on the markets if larger than a regional war spreads here, if any of that spreads here. So how exactly do tensions overseas like Iran and Israel's feud impact your portfolio? Joining me now, we've got Ken Mahoney, Mahoney Asset Management CEO. Ken, great to have you here with us today. First and foremost, I mean, you you wake up this morning or perhaps you're tracking it overnight and you see what's playing out in the Middle East. What immediately comes to your mind? Well, there's going to be some type of retaliation. There's no doubt about it. And it's going to be another headline, nagging headline, you know, that the market has to deal with, which, by the way, it's dealt with pretty good, pretty resilient, considering everything that's been thrown at it. And I think it's going to be kind of more like Fed governors. You know, they go out there and they say, oh, we're going to pencil in uh, rate cuts. So we're not going to have the rate cuts you're hoping for. And the market sells off. I think this is going to be very similar along the way. Every time we get a headline that says Israel is going to retaliate on Wednesday at 4 a.m., it seems like they telegraph these things nowadays, uh, we're going to see a market uh, get, get hit. So I, I think, though, for most of your viewers, though, they should still you know zoom out a bit. This is definitely emotional. It is not fun to be around uh, some of these awful, awful headlines that you read about. Uh, but you got to zoom out. You know, we've been through this before and more focus on earnings when they come about, especially next week's earnings, technology earnings. But by and large, we want to make sure no one makes emotional and say, I'm going to sell everything. Hey, you may want to hedge a little bit, some inverse ETFs, but don't don't give it away if you're still planning for retirement long term. Eventually, this will settle itself. Yeah, Ken, it's a great reminder. I mean, of course, this is one of the news items and events uh, that takes place that you factor away into some of those exogenous events or exogenous threats that we don't see coming. It happens. We have to react. How can someone best exogenous threat proof their portfolio for the future, especially given a year where we're going to have a lot of talk that takes place leading up to the U.S. election here as well about foreign relations? 
Right. So the different ways to hedge, one can use, um, you know, military defense companies like RTX. Raytheon is one of the symbols that your viewers can take a look at. Oil, whether you buy a basket or individual stocks like Exxon or Chevron. So there's definitely ways to kind of go around, again, as a hedge, not as, a, again, we really think technology and the big tech is still a way to go with the outsized earnings that they have. But, you know, if you kind of want to say, hey, I want to hedge my portfolio a little bit, inverse ETFs, maybe some oil, maybe some def defense contractors, or maybe selling off 20, 25% putting cash. So we get that wish down, you know, you have some power to dry. Again, if you're fully 100% invested, you don't get that opportunity. That's why there's nothing wrong to do you know, any of those things above that I recommended. Ken, as you so rightly mentioned as well and reminded, the market trying to figure out where should it place more of its attention? Is it in earnings? Is it in the economic data that comes out this morning from the Census Bureau on retail sales? Or is it some of the overseas events that take place? Where do you believe that weighting is right now based on the activity that we're seeing transpire here today, at least in the major averages? Right. I still like to think it's earnings. Look, there's been a lot of talk about the Fed. Look, and NVIDIA and the, their revenue year over year, Microsoft, some of these leaders, whether the Fed cuts a quarter rate in June or September, it doesn't mean nothing really for them. Uh, again, it means a lot for banks and spreads and so forth. Uh, so again, I, I like this for investors. Yes, there's gonna be a lot of things buzzing around. There may be some opportunities when we get these big wish downs over e either retaliation or a Fed governor, you know, slipping and talking about no Fed cuts. But at the end of the day, I think you have to, your investors should follow earnings. And we know where to find those earnings, AI, those companies that already have strong businesses, strong verticals, and now you add I AI into them Mix, that's pretty good. So I'm looking at the video, Microsoft, Meta, those leaders. Uh, again, even with all the negative headlines, even with the Fed maybe not cutting rates this summer, still that's we believe is the place to be. And I think those companies can overlook some of these nagging headlines we're going to have to deal with. Ken Mahoney, thanks so much for taking the time here with us today. Ken Mahoney, of course, who is the CEO of Mahoney Asset Management. Appreciate the time. Thank you, Brad. Certainly. Well, the consumer remains resilient. Retail sales topping Wall Street expectations, continuing its upward trend by rising seven-tenths of a percent in March compared to four-tenths of a percent that was expected. But inflated prices are still impacting the cautious consumer and their household budgets. So how can you be a smart shopper in times of sticky inflation? Let's bring in Barbara Ginty, who is the host of Future Rich Podcast. Barbara, great to have you here with us today. Uh, let, let's turn this from potential wealth into kinetic wealth for a lot of folks out there. We're trying to figure out how they can be smart shoppers. Where are the areas that we saw within this retail sales report that show that there are still deals to be made out there? I think that the average consumer right now is, is stretched pretty thin, um, but obviously the reports are showing that we're still spending. Uh, so I think this is the time to be cautious and reevaluate your budget and take into account inflation, which we still have out there. So your dollars are not going as far or lasting as long as they used to be. Um, and so it's, I think, a good time to be cautious about overuse of credit card and also the new phenomenon of buy now, pay later, which is always at a point of sale. And I don't think that's meant to be a point of sale decision. That's interesting. And, and the way that consumers are spending, I mean, we repeatedly get even more information about where consumers are leveraging cash versus just mm -hmm. swiping or tapping to pay. Wonder what you make of that. Yeah, so they're ta they're tapping to pay. I would say for the you know the depreciating items, and they're using cash for the expenses that need to be paid in cash, right? So for housing, daycare, um, food, usually those are ones that are going to be paid in cash. And obviously, those with children know that in, you know aside from housing costs being at all time high, right, with still having a higher interest rate, so those who locked in that two and a half percent, you know, COVID mortgage you know, still being sticker shocked by what a mortgage costs now at closer to 7%. But those with children are having those extreme uh, daycare costs, which can be more than a mortgage. You know, it was particularly- Those are your typical cash expenses. Right. And it was particularly interesting in the consumer confidence, the most recent reading that we found for, for March, on a six-month basis, buying plans for interest rate sensitive items like autos, homes, big ticket mm -hmm. appliances, dipping, once again here. And so where are the areas that consumers can certainly find some deals out there and perhaps be able to take advantage of the environment right now? 
I think that cars have also gotten very expensive, but I think it's important to try and wait for a sale. There are, first of all, with credit unions, you'll see auto loan sales. And then also when you're going to shop for a car, they want to move inventory, right? So you just have to go in there and know your price point and then be willing to stick to it. And, and you have to be willing to walk away from the table. So if they're not going to give you the deal you want, you have to be willing to walk away. But those big ticket items are items where you can really negotiate um, and get the price that you're looking for, which makes all the difference for your budget. You know, it's particularly interesting, especially as you were writing about getting rich quick, akin to gambling here. And, and I'd love to kind of pivot the conversation in that direction. Sure. Break that down a little bit more, uh, more for us and, and take us into your thesis there. So my thesis is that there is no real quick way to accumulate wealth. I mean, if you study entrepreneurs um, and you study successful people who have achieved real wealth, right? Financial independence is what I consider real wealth with the decision where you don't have to go to work anymore, where you're in charge of all decisions in your life, whether or not you stay in a relationship, whether or not you stay in a job, right? That's financial independence, having full control over your life. And that doesn't happen overnight. Um, we see all the phenomenons, right? Like GameStop. Very few people became millionaires out of that. That was very rare occurrence. Usually what it takes to build real wealth and build financial independence is doing the consistent boring thing, right? Which is saving on a regular basis, living within your means and allowing compounding interest to work for you and not against you. All right, Barbara, I I've been trying for years just to Rebecca Black my finances and just come out with a one hit wonder type of scenario <laughs> that perhaps can create some type of windfall. I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out what my tune is going to be. We'll workshop Let us that. know if you find the one hit wonder. I, you you, you will know about it. It'll be top of the charts. Barbara, thanks so much for taking the time here. Barbara Ginty, who is the CFP and also host of Future Rich Podcast. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, coming up, everyone, it's April 15th, which means it's, of course, the anniversary of the day that Jackie Robinson played his first game. No, I'm just, I'm just playing there, but it is, actually. It's also tax filing day. Did you file yet? Don't fret if you did not. We'll bring you all the info that you need to make good with the IRS. That's after the break.
As George Harrison once said, yeah, I'm the tax man and you're working for no one but me, end quote. Well, whether you like it or not, today is tax day and the IRS expects tens of millions of returns to be filed today just before the deadline, just squeaking in by the hair of their chinny chin chin. And if you're one of those millions of people, our next guest is here to make sure you are in good shape when the clock strikes midnight tonight. Let's welcome in Tom O'Saban, who is the Director of Tax Content at the National Association of Tax Professionals. Tom, great to have you here with us today. All right, it's deadline day, so what do people need to know as they're perhaps hitting the send button or, you know, getting the liquor ready for that postage stamp or, you know, just closing up the envelope? You get the picture. I sure do get the picture. And you might be surprised what I'm going to say to begin is that April 15th might not mean anything to you. Hmm. That is... If you're expecting a refund, you don't even have to file today. You can actually wait up to three years after the due date and the IRS will give you your money and they'll pay you interest. So maybe today is not the day to panic, I guess is what I'm trying, trying to say to everybody out there. We are by, by human nature procrastinators. So who I'm really talking to are the people who owe taxes. <laughs> so two schools of thought, one would be if you knew what you owe, then you probably have your return finished, but maybe you don't. So at the very least, what you want to do today, and I'm a practitioner, I've been one for 33 years, we're frazzled. Today is probably not the day to sit down with your box of receipts, spread everything out, and expect that that tax professional is going to have the quality, let's say, of what they would have had two months ago, or they might have in a couple of weeks. So I would advise today, get an extension filed. The extension, by the way, is in time to file, not in time to pay. So if you're not sure, then you're gonna have to send something in or at the very least get that extension filed and then get together with your tax professional or sit down with a clear mind, maybe in a couple of weeks and get that return paid in. You know, get that return submitted when your mind is clearer. You know, my grandma used to say that haste makes waste. Hmm. Let's not turn that haste into a big mistake on a tax return that either the IRS comes back later and says, hmm, really didn't know where you got these numbers. Right. Or secondly, you miss out on some deductions or some refunds. So my, my first advice is don't panic today. Re re remember, haste makes waste. Yeah. Okay. A word of woosah out the gate. Thank you for that, Tom, because uh, a lot sure. of us certainly do appreciate it and uh, need it on the day. There's also the postmarking that, that needs to be discussed here as well here. And we're taking a look here on the screen at some of your tips uh, for filing taxes at the last minute here. And we've talked about the extension, but specifically, there are a lot of people who use software using their, you know, wh whatever the case may be. None of them paid for the right to be mentioned right now. So uh, we'll let the viewers out there determine which is best for them. But one way or the other, software and the AI that's baked into software has become a button that people hit a lot more. What are your tips for those people? Well, the, it's, the same kind of, it's the same kind of thing. Be, be prepared. I strongly recommend the use of software, and there's a lot of good ones that are out there. What the software does is it eliminates those mathematical, those simple type of errors that people make, and, and, and getting that eliminated and you know pressing that button by you know, 11 p.m. Eastern time, we'll make sure it's received by by midnight. But that's the thing again, too, if, if you're just starting to put your information together today, you know, we have this vision of the old uh, Saturday evening post drawing by Norman Rockwell of the person sitting there and it's 10 minutes to midnight and there's papers piled up all over their desk and they're trying to get the return finished. I think that's a mistake, you know, trying to get it done and get it done accurately by doing it at the last minute. I suggest filing an extension today. And so let's talk a little bit more about that extension. The I believe it's 4868. What do people need to know about that? And what's the date, the key date from there? Absolutely. If you're not in an area where the IRS has provided an extension because there's been a disaster area or, or terrorist attacks or something like that, the extension, again, is in time to file, not in time to pay. If April 15th is your due date, you file that extension today, you have till October 15th to file the return, October 15th of 2024. So, and that extension doesn't go beyond that date. I've had people who come in multiple years later and say, well, I filed an extension for that year. Well, it doesn't last forever. Hmm. It's only good for six months. So that's the key here is that it is an extension in time to file, not in time to pay. So if you have no clue 
about whether or not you're going to owe taxes and you might owe, still file the extension because the government calls that first penalty a failure to file penalty. And the failure to file penalty is based on how much tax you still owe. So we can get, a, get rid of that failure to file penalty, but the failure to pay penalty and interest will start accruing after midnight tonight. So maybe that's not the worst situation if you can get to your return in a couple of weeks with a clear mind or the clear mind of your tax professional and sit down and lay that out and prepare an accurate return. And then I want to say something else. Owing the IRS money is not the end of the world. They really want to work with you but they'll work with you once they have the return file. Listen, nobody's gonna drive up to your door tomorrow and have three black Suburbans pull up and all these people get out talking to their shoulder and they're gonna take you away for not filing your taxes. Let Leave that to the FBI for criminals, but take a slow approach and yes, file that extension today. If you think you typically owe money, send some money in with it so you're not hit with those failure to pay penalties and interest. Tom, thanks so much for taking the time here today. Certainly do appreciate it. Tom Osaban, who is the Director of Tax Content at the National Association of Tax Professionals. Appreciate the time. Always a pleasure. Certainly. So you're finally getting around to filing your taxes, and you get smacked with a surprise bill from the IRS. That money you thought you would save for a summer vacation? Gone. To help with some guidance on managing your tax withholding so you have no more surprises next tax season is our very own Rebecca Chen. Set us up for the 2025 filing <laughs> season that looks back at 2024, Rebecca. So tax, tax withholding is something that I think everybody's fairly familiar with. But I, I do want to go back and touch on the basic on what exactly it is so you can get it right in the future or there are no surprise bills, as you just mentioned, Brad, for the future. Really, um, how a CPA explained this to me is that Tax withholding is a prepayment that you pay to the government for your taxes throughout the year. So every period out of your paycheck, you pay a little bit of tax withholdings to the government. And at the end of the year, your W-2 tallies that up. And it tells you how much you have in your withholding or how much you prepay in your taxes. Now, if you have more prepayment than you need, you get a refund. But if you have less, then you get a tax bill. Um, so in order to avoid any surprises, the trick isn't to over withhold or under withhold. The trick is to know how what you want to withhold. Um, and what I mean by that is when you're sitting down and looking at your um, income for the year for the year to decide how much you want to withhold, think about what is your withholding goal. Now, I know that sounds completely weird. Why would you have a goal for withholding? But think about if you want to have a refund, if you want to owe taxes, or do you want to break even throughout the year? Intuition will come to you and say, I want a refund. But having a refund isn't always a good thing. When you have too much refund, it just means that you gave the IRS a tax, an interest-free loan throughout the year. And that comes to, oh, and then my next point is, what if you want um, to owe money? If you owe money, not only does it mean that you didn't give the IRS a interest-free loan, but you could actually use that withholding that you were supposed to prepay them, put it in a high um, yield saving account and earn some interest. So by the end of the year, take that money out to pay the IRS for your tax liability, but you also and you also earn some interest throughout the year. So really think about what is your goal. Now I'm not one way isn't always necessarily better than the other because if you have some tax refund, it could just be a good way to save because for you personally, you want to save, you want to have a forced saving. So yeah. really, the trick to not having a surprise during tax season is not having to pay or getting a refund, but it's really knowing exactly where you sit based on how you um, set up your goal at the beginning of the year. So Rebecca, when should you consider adjusting your withholdings and, and how do you go about doing that? That's a great question. Um, you know, withholding is both an art and science. And knowing <laughs> when to <laughs> knowing when to adjust it, it's not always uh, so cl so clear. But just know that if you have some 
major life event happening uh, and by major and these can be very personal like did you get married did you get divorced did you have a kid all these things will impact your taxes so when you have these things happening throughout the year these are the times that you probably want to look at your withholdings um, other financial happenings in your life can also trigger um, you to want to change your withholding and that includes did you buy a house did you sell a house did you sell any cryptocurrencies and make a lot of money I, I hope you did. Um, and because if you did, you may want to look at your withholding again and see if that is worth updating. And by and most people actually, then most people will think about, okay, I don't even know. It just comes out of my paycheck. How do I, where do I even go to change something like that? Just talk, talk to your HR department. Ask them for a W-4, which is a withholding form, and update from there. They, you can update this anytime during the year because it's your money and make sure you're just making sure that you're not surprised throughout at the end of the year, whether you're over withholding or under withholding. Yeah, Rebecca, I'm very much just waiting for that checkbox to appear on the paperwork that says or asks, do you co-parent a pet? Because cats are expensive. <laughs> All right, Rebecca, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Well, the stock market can deliver a jolt when we least expect it. Take last week, for instance. Stocks slumped after a surprisingly hot consumer price index report that spooked investors, along with an underwhelming showing of big bank results to kick off Q1 earnings season. So with sell-offs in the stock market, investors want to know, how will this impact my portfolio, your portfolio, ours? For more on this, we're joined by Yahoo Finance reporter Carrie Hannon. Hey, Carrie. Hey, Brad, good to be here. Um, you know, the point is, I like to think of the investing portfolios I'm addressing right here are people who are saving for retirement, okay? So when this happens, and we see this a lot, right, that maybe this is how the permanent state of things now, up and down, up and down, no rash moves, right? You might do some fine tuning, but in general, most of us are focused on the long term. So what that means is we're in retirement plans through our employers, perhaps, where we're automatically investing. We're buying low, we're buying high right now. If you're in a target date fund, they're automatically adjusting it to keep it to you what you've set as your risk tolerance, how much equities, how much bonds you have. Now, I think that it's important to note, you know, that the past year is more important than the past week. So you do need to look at your portfolio at least once a year and say, hey, am I out of whack here for what my risk tolerance is? And that's usually if you're 7 to 10 percent off the amount you want in equ equities balanced with bonds. One caveat to that, Brad, is that if you are nearing retirement, I encourage people really to take a look at you might want to slide over a little more into the fixed income, into some of these cash uh, equivalents like CDs or treasuries, because right now, while the Fed is not uh, dropping rates anytime soon, that it's you're still getting some pretty good, you know, they're they're touching 5% and a little higher there. So it's not a bad thing to kind of do a little rebalancing. But I basically tell people, take a breath. You're in it for the long term. All right. Great reminders there. Carrie, while we have you stick around, switching gears here for a hot second. More <laughs> older workers are working now than in previous decades. 62% of older workers are working full time compared with 47% in 1987. That's according to Pew Research Center. Carrie, I hate using the word old, so we'll just say more seasoned, more intelligent, uh, largely, folks out there still in the workforce. Why should employers consider hiring older workers as they classify? Well, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, come on, get with it. I mean, what planet are they on? This study that came out by Transamerica the past uh, week or so ago showed that when they talked to employers, they thought that 62 should be the cutoff for hiring. And I mean, 58 should be the cutoff for hiring. And 62 really is when people should start stepping out of the workplace. But in fact, that is so not true. And that more of us are working longer uh, for many reasons, for financial stability, just because we simply love being on the job, the mental engagement, all of the great things that come with working. But more importantly for employers is demographic change changes mean you have to look at this demographic because there's not as many younger workers coming up. And as the population shifts to an aging global workforce, um, they need to start making accommodations to figure out how do we attract these people with um, and retain them that have the experience. We don't they can do the job right now. We don't have to onboard them, train them in any massive way. Uh, it's really cost effective that way. And 
and truly, um, an older worker tends to be more loyal. Not as much job jumping there, but the most important thing is they're qualified. And in the labor market today, that is still fairly tight, where workers saying we really need to find workers that can do our jobs. This is the the group that you need to be looking towards and making accommodations, uh, things like phased retirement, flexible work schedules, job sharing, um, more workplace training for not just the younger workers, but the older workers become age friendly. I'm not that's kind of the message out there. Yeah, maturity, uh, interpersonal skills as well, and historical context, all good things uh, for some of the kind of upper end of the workforce to be able to kind of pitch to some of those potential employers out there as well. Carrie, thanks so much. We appreciate it. Thanks, Brad. Thanks. Coming up, investing in the next generation's financial success will break down how you can talk to children about financial literacy. That's up next. Eighty-five percent of high school students want to learn about financial topics in school, according to an Intuit study. But only half of states provide a standalone personal finance course, leaving young people to get their information elsewhere. For how you can teach the next generation financial literacy, Tiana Portillo joins us now. Vanguard financial advisor and manager is here with us. Tiana, great to have you on. First and foremost, I mean, why? Why are we still in this instance where there is not enough financial literacy that gets taught and baked into the K through 12 programs and what's being done actively to change that? Thanks so much for the question, Brad. Honestly, I'm just happy that we're in a position where new laws are being implemented where 
schools, I'm sorry, where new laws are being implemented, where schools are now actually burdening children's exposure to more financial matters. Absolutely. And you think about what financial education looks like for youth. A lot of programs just find it, trying to figure out where to start at. Where do you think they should and where should this conversation begin? I say it should start with the children. Um, as parents, we can impact our child's every single day. It could come to just practical money exercises or utilizing everyday life to show your children the importance of proper money management. I do it personally with my daughter. I have a 14-year-old daughter. And when it comes to going grocery shopping, I'm teaching her the importance of inflation by teaching her the, the cost of prices rising when it comes to our food. Or it could be something as simple as allowance, right? Ensuring that she's carving out a certain portion of her savings towards allowance. So I would say parents, you know, you should start at home and actually have conversations with your children because we only know what we're, we're taught. All right, your daughter is very lucky in that regard to get those <laughs> lessons very early on. What I, I imagine your conversations also extend into investments. For parents that are trying to discuss investments with their kids, where have you seen or heard success in beginning that dialogue? Yeah, so even for myself personally, um, as you mentioned, the schools, our schooling system, sometimes they don't have the resources available to teach our children. So I would utilize resources such as My Classroom Economy is actually a resource that is powered by Vanguard, where you can really teach your children the importance of earning, saving, as well as investing. And then for parents, we have My Home Economy, which helps parents teach children practical money management skills. Certainly. And then for some of the real world scenarios that people are navigating through and trying to figure out, okay, where do I need to lean further into understanding more or learning more in, you know, my financial literacy journey? Because, I mean, there are always going to be new laws. There's always going to be new ways to kind of take advantage of codes uh, and to set yourself up correctly. So what are some of the real world scenarios that, that you hear even anecdotally or some of your clients come to you guys with about how they can adjust their own strategy too? No, great question. So current day, I don't, um, I don't have clients of my own. I actually manage financial advisors who help clients achieve their own financial success. And honestly, it's going to vary depending on the individual. Some people are very savvy when it comes to investing, and they have the knowledge and the breadth to be able to teach their children the importance of these things, and others may not know. So I would say if you are uncomfortable with having those discussions, you should definitely rely on an expert to help your children. Tiana Patillo, who is the Vanguard Financial Advisor Manager from and joining us from the great state of Pennsylvania. Thanks so much for taking the time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Certainly. Bye. Coming up, everyone, build your confidence, snapping a four-month period of gains in April. So what does this mean for the real estate market? We're going to dive into much more on that after the break. You're watching Well on Yahoo Finance.
builder confidence in the market for newly built single family homes was 51 in April. That was the reading, which was unchanged from March, breaking a four month period of gains, according to the NAHB Wells Fargo Housing Market Index. Yahoo Finance's Danny Romero is here with a breakdown of what this means for the housing market. A reading of 51. Is that surprising here at this juncture? Well, home builders are feeling choked by higher mortgage rates and higher than expected inflation readings during the first quarter of this year. Now, the index stayed at 51 in April. And so any number that above 50 really means that builders view that the housing market is really good rather than poor. Uh, but mortgage rates remain very high compared to the beginning of this year, which is pushing buyers and sellers to those sidelines as this spring selling season is really working, kicking into gear. So the 30-year fixed mortgage rate right now is hovering around 7.3% today, according to Mortgage News Daily. And home prices haven't leveled off, Brad. Builders are Aren't, and, but builders aren't slashing home prices right now compared to what they were doing um, at the beginning of this year. That's what the National Association of Home Builders reported. Another point to really factor into the, all of this equation is that a group of researchers from the Federal Housing Finance Agency found that the mortgage rate lock-in effect mm. could last a few years years. Wow. Now, that sounds bad news for potential buyers, right? So sorry, you're not going to get that 3% mortgage rate. But this is actually could be good news for builders, because they'll will need that inventory to be added to the market. So there'll be uh, more incentive to build. But remember, publicly uh, traded home builders have been offering these incentives to attract buyers into that market. So that could still be a factor into this. Uh, the popular one is the mortgage rate buy downs. That's when the builder upfronts the cost to lower the rate on the loan. So the new home market will continue to outperform the resale market, especially as these mortgage rates are hovering around that 7%. All right, a key reading, key context as well. Danny, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Well, since COVID restrictions have lifted over the last few years, some employers have tried to incentivize workers to return to the office, but remote work and hybrid work has remained quite popular for workers. Castle Systems, which measures badge swipes across 138 cities in the U.S., puts office occupancy for the top 10 cities at under 50%. And according to TREP, more than $2.2 trillion in commercial debt maturities are coming due between now and the end of 2027. So what does this all mean for the real estate sector and the consumer? Here with more, we've got Adam Friedman, who is the distressed real estate chair of Olshan Frome and Woloski LLP, a bankruptcy and financial restructuring firm. Okay, so we just laid out all the stats here. First and foremost, Adam got to know what this sets up for the commercial real estate market. Well, first, it's great to be with you, Brad. Thanks for having me. Certainly. Um, I mean, you've really set it up nicely. Since COVID, uh, the office market and really the commercial real estate market has gone through seismic changes. You noted the statistic, only half of the amount of people are coming into offices. That has a significant impact on the valuation of these office buildings. At the same time, TREP is accurate. Uh, they're a great service provider. There's over $2 trillion of mortgages coming due. So the problem is, on top of those really significant factors, interest rates, as all of these loans are coming due, are significantly higher than they were when these loans were originated. These loans were originated, uh, multifamily and office building owners were probably getting loans at 3 4%. If they can even get a loan right now, it's for double that percentage. And inflationary pressures are also hitting the real estate market, energy prices, insurance prices. All of these things mean loans are now in distress at the absolute worst time that they can be when they are all maturing with higher interest rates. What role does the Federal Reserve play within this as well, Adam, from what you've been tracking? Well, the Federal Reserve obviously sets and the government sets baseline interest rates and, and interest rates are driven by the rates that the government set. So interest rates have spiked significantly over the past, which is great for depositors who are used to get nothing on their savings accounts. Now they're getting four to five percent in a money market. But the interest rate also means commercial borrowers and business borrowers are paying significantly higher. The federal government has been encouraging banks 
to, and they've issued guidance to uh, give them parameters to work out loans with real estate owners, commercial real estate owners that may be having a difficult time refinancing their loans or even paying interest on loans. So they've provided guidance and lenders and borrowers have been looking at that guidance carefully. Adam, what comes of these real estate assets then if you see foreclosures or you see some of the loans not be able to be met with payments for those who were either starting on construction or finishing construction and, and don't have tenants that are willing to sign off on leases at some of these new terms? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Brad. And that's really what I spend a lot of my day doing every day. Uh, you've uh, Lenders and borrowers have to come to the table and resolve these loans. Uh, buildings are worth sometimes half, even less than half of the valuation of when uh, the values were when these loans were made. So borrowers and lenders have to work out deals, restructurings with each other. You may have heard the term extending the pretend or kicking the can down the road. Uh, in the interim, right now, lenders like to get some kind of interest in the door uh, while there is a right sizing of the market. So lenders and borrowers are working on loan modifications. Lenders are trying to get some interest payments made by the borrower, and they are extending the maturity of the loans in many instances with the hope that the valuation of these buildings and their collateral will increase. So if I'm getting current interest and I extend the maturity for a year, maybe the value of the building will be greater and that will increase the chance for the borrower to keep the building and the lender to get repaid as much as possible. And what about for tenants in the near term? Should we expect any material price fluctuations at this juncture? No, I don't know. I don't have the data for tenants, but I can tell you that multifamily owners, uh, building owners for apartments, uh, are under the very same pressures that commercial office building owners are. They have increased uh, interest rates on those loans. A lot of the multifamily loans are coming due, and a lot of those building owners are facing the same inflationary pressures. Uh, I would say that tenants should not fear. Um, they're going to have a lease. All they have to do is make those lease payments. Uh, but it, time will tell whether uh, rental rates in different parts of the country will increase or decrease. I know in New York City, where I am, uh, the rental market has actually gotten uh, very tight and uh, the rents have increased post-COVID, which is, you know, an interesting dynamic. Adam Freeman, thanks so much for taking the time here with us today. A lot of great context and, and info that you've been able to give us on this broader CRE conversation. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Certainly. Coming up, everyone, big moves in stocks can spook investors, but the Budget Nista is going to join me with some tips on how to keep your cool and keep building wealth, even in a volatile market on the other side of the short break. Stick around.
So stocks had their worst week of the year last week. But so far in 2024, markets have been on an upswing, and many strategists expect them to surge even higher through the end of the year. So how do you take a step back from the current volatility and continue to invest and build wealth? Joining me now with some tips, we've got Tiffany Aliche, who is a personal finance educator, also known, of course, in your feeds as the Budget Nista. Great to see you as well, Tiffany. Uh, first and foremost, some volatility, but investors still trying to figure out, okay, where can they take a step back, assess the broader landscape, and perhaps make sure that their portfolio alignment is still in alignment with their goals at the end of the day? No, definitely. So one, Brad, you're going to want to spread your investments across like a various number of asset classes. So like stocks, bonds, real estate, commodities, diversification is always going to help you mitigate some risks, right? Also two, focus on the long term. I mean, I get it. There's ups, there's downs. But if you are a long term investor, you understand that's just part of the way things go. So you focus on what long term investing looks like and make sure it aligns with your overall goals. Um, Third, I would say beef up your knowledge, right? This is a really great time to really lean in and learn more about the asset classes that you're investing in and any new company you might be interested in. I actually partnered with one of my favorite investing um, experts, Terry Ijama. We have this five-day live masterclass that starts today, actually, Brad. I hope I see you there. Um, you can sign up at budgetnistastockbonuses.com. Uh, um, but also, my favorite is to consider dollar cost averaging. So this is when you invest regularly um, at a specific interval, you know, because that means you get to catch the market when it's up. You get to catch the market when it's down. And on average, you will average out what those returns are going to be. Lastly, I would say um, two things. Don't panic because volatil volatility in the marketplace is a natural part of investing. That's just how it goes. And keep cash on hand because when there's volatility, there's usually some deals to be found and made. So you want to be able to lean in and take advantage of that. You know, speaking of volatility, uh, of course, and I'm not sure if you heard one of our earlier conversations, but we're trying to give people the best sense as well of how to perhaps exogenous threat proof their portfolio, especially when things take place, perhaps in this case, in the Middle East, a lot of investors trying to figure out, okay, what does this mean for my portfolio? Where do I need to be, you know, taking stock or just looking across the scenario to make sure I'm well positioned? You know, how can someone aptly do that? Well, I have to see one of the things we know that we can't we can't control what happens externally, but certainly you control what happens internally. So to understand that geopolitical tensions can often increase market volatility because investors can feel uncertain and they can feel at risk. And so understanding that that like um, escalations and conflict um, can help with um, sharp fluctuations that you want to be mindful of that these might not last forever, but you might see them. So kind of like get yourself prepared for them. Um, anticipate that there's going to be a flight to safety. So during periods of heightened tensions like this, investors seek safe haven assets. You're going to see a lot of people, Brad, talk about gold, government bonds, specific currencies, maybe like the Swiss franc, Japanese yen, right? So this flight to safety is really typical for any time there's any sort of volatility, but especially in the, in the stock market. Um, so you're also going to see people with this pressure of wanting to like release some of the more riskier assets like um like stocks. Mm -hmm. um, so this actually might be a good time to pick some things up if this is a good underlying company, or it might be a time to like reevaluate does this make sense depending on where that company is located. Um, investor sentiment in general, when there are there's a lot of uh, tension worldwide, um, tends to be a little pessimistic, and when people are pessimistic. They tend to spend less. They tend to invest less. Um, they tend to be more conservative. So being mindful of that. Um, so you just want to be careful that wherever you are, like where the most of your money is being invested, I want you to be mindful. Like where is that company located? How are they um, affected by what's happening in that in that part of the world? Right. And should you adjust? And lastly, there's going to be policy responses. So governments, central banks. Right. These um, organizations are going to respond to these um, geopolitical tensions with policies that are going to help to stabilize markets, ideally, right. um, mitigate economic risk. So you want to be mindful of that. So keep your eye at Yahoo Finance because this is where you're going to 100 percent. Tiffany, we got to leave things there on the day. Tiffany Aliche, who is a personal finance educator, also known as the Budget Nista. Thanks so much for taking the time, Tiffany.
Thank you. Absolutely. Everyone, that's it for now. I'm Brad Smith. Thanks so much for watching Wealth. We've got much more here on Yahoo Finance throughout today and back at 11 a.m. Eastern Time tomorrow for Wealth.